This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by CBW Simon, www.CanadianBlackWatch.com. September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 64 the beggar. The evening passed on. Madame de Villefort expressed a desire to return to Paris, which Madame Danglars had not dared to do, notwithstanding the uneasiness she experienced. On his wife's request, M. de Villefort was the first to give the signal of departure. He offered his seat in his landau to Madame Danglars, that she might be under the care of his wife. As for M. Danglars, absorbed in an interesting conversation with M. Cavalcanti, he paid no attention to anything that was passing. While Monte Cristo had begged the smelling bottle from Madame de Villefort, he had noticed the approach of Villefort to Madame Danglars, and he soon guessed all that had passed between them, though the words had been uttered in so low a voice as to hardly be heard by Madame Danglars. Without opposing their arrangements, he allowed Morel, Chateau Renault, and Debray to leave on horseback, and the ladies in M. de Villefort's carriage. Danglars, more and more delighted with Major Cavalcanti, had offered him a seat in his carriage. Andrea Cavalcanti found his Tilbury waiting at the door. The groom, in every respect a caricature of the English fashion, was standing on tiptoe to hold a large iron-gray horse. Andrea had spoken very little during dinner. He was an intelligent lad, and he feared to utter some absurdity before so many grand people, amongst whom, with dilating eyes, he saw the king's attorney. Then he had been seized upon by Danglars, who, with a rapid glance at the stiff-necked old major and his modest son, and taking into consideration the hospitality of the Count, made up his mind that he was in the society of some nabob come to Paris to finish the worldly education of his heir. He contemplated with unspeakable delight the large diamond which shone on the Major's little finger, for the Major, like a prudent man, in case of any accident happening to his banknotes, had immediately converted them into an available asset. Then. After dinner, on the pretext of business, he questioned the father and son upon their mode of living, and the father and son, previously informed that it was through Danglars the one was to receive his forty-eight thousand francs, and the other fifty thousand livres annually, were so full of affability that they would have shaken hands even with the banker's servants. So much did their gratitude need an object to expend itself upon. One thing above all the rest heightened the respect, nay, almost the veneration of Danglars for Cavalcanti. The latter, faithful to the principle of Horace nil admirari, had contented himself with showing his knowledge by declaring in what lake the best lampreys were caught. Then he had eaten some without saying a word more. Danglars, therefore, concluded that such luxuries were common at the table of the illustrious descendant of the Cavalcanti, who most likely in Lucca fed upon trout brought from Switzerland and lobsters sent from England, by the same means used by the Count to bring the lampreys from Lake Fusaro and the sterlet from the Volga. Thus it was with much politeness of manner that he heard Cavalcanti pronounce these words. Tomorrow, sir, I shall have the honor of waiting upon you on business. And I, sir, said Danglars, shall be most happy to receive you. Upon which he offered to take Cavalcanti in his carriage to the Hotel des Princes, if it would not be depriving him of the company of his son. To this Cavalcanti replied by saying that for some time past his son had lived independently of him, that he had his own horses and carriages, and that not having come together, it would not be difficult for them to leave separately. The Major seated himself, therefore, by the side of Danglars, who was more and more charmed with the ideas of order and economy which ruled this man, and yet 
who, being able to allow his son sixty thousand francs a year, might be supposed to possess a fortune of five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand livres. As for Andrea, he began, by way of showing off, to scold his groom, who, instead of bringing the Tilbury to the steps of the house, had taken it to the outer door, thus giving him the trouble of walking thirty steps to reach it. The groom heard him with humility, took the bit of the impatient animal with his left hand, and with the right held out the reins to Andrea, who, taking them from him, rested his polished boot lightly on the step. At that moment a hand touched his shoulder. The young man turned round, thinking that Danglars or Monte Cristo had forgotten something they wished to tell him, and had returned just as they were starting. But instead of either of these he saw nothing but a strange face, sunburnt and encircled by a beard, with eyes brilliant as carbuncles, and a smile upon the mouth which displayed a perfect set of white teeth, pointed and sharp as the wolf's or jackal's. A red handkerchief encircled his gray head. Torn and filthy garments covered his large bony limbs, which seemed as though, like those of a skeleton, they would rattle as he walked. And the hand with which he leaned upon the young man's shoulder, and which was the first thing Andrea saw, seemed of gigantic size. Did the young man recognize that face by the light of the lantern in his tilbury, or was he merely struck with the horrible appearance of his interrogator? We cannot say but only relate the fact that he shuddered and stepped back suddenly. "'What do you want of me?' he asked. "'Pardon me, my friend, if I disturb you,' said the man with the red handkerchief. "'But I want to speak to you.' "'You have no right to beg at night,' said the groom, endeavoring to rid his master of the troublesome intruder. "'I am not begging, my fine fellow.' said the unknown to the servant, with so ironical an expression of the eye, and so frightful a smile, that he withdrew. I only wish to say two or three words to your master, who gave me a commission to execute about a fortnight ago. Come, said Andrea, with sufficient nerve for his servant not to perceive his agitation. What do you want? Speak quickly, friend. The man said in a low voice, I wish... I wish you to spare me the walk back to Paris. I am very tired, and as I have not eaten so good a dinner as you, I can scarcely stand." The young man shuddered at this strange familiarity. "'Tell me,' he said, "'tell me what you want.' "'Well, then, I want you to take me up in your fine carriage and carry me back.' Andrea turned pale but said nothing. Yes, said the man, thrusting his hands into his pockets and looking impudently at the youth. I have taken the whim into my head. Do you understand, Master Benedetto? At this name, no doubt, the young man reflected a little, for he went towards his groom, saying, This man is right. I did indeed charge him with a commission, the result of which he must tell me. Walk to the barrier. There, take a cab, that you may not be too late." The surprised groom retired. "'Let me at least reach a shady spot,' said Andrea. "'Oh, as for that, I'll take you to a splendid place,' said the man with the handkerchief. And taking the horse's bit, he led the tilbury, where it was certainly impossible for any one to witness the honor that Andrea conferred upon him. "'Don't think I want the glory of riding in your fine carriage,' said he. "'Oh, no, it's only because I am tired, and also because I have a little business to talk over with you.' "'Come, step in,' said the young man. It was a pity this scene had not occurred in daylight 
for it was curious to see this rascal throwing himself heavily down on the cushion beside the young and elegant driver of the Tilbury. Andrea drove past the last house in the village without saying a word to his companion, who smiled complacently, as though well pleased to find himself traveling in so comfortable a vehicle. Once out of Otoy, Andrea looked around in order to assure himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and then, stopping the horse and crossing his arms before the man, he asked, Now, tell me why you have come to disturb my tranquillity. Let me ask you why you deceived me. How have I deceived you? How, do you ask? When we parted at the Pont du Var, you told me you were going to travel through Piedmont and Tuscany. But instead of that, you come to Paris. How does that annoy you? It does not. On the contrary, I think it will answer my purpose. So, said Andrea, you are speculating upon me? What fine words he uses. I warn you, Master Carteruse, that you are mistaken. Well, well, don't be angry, my boy. You know well enough what it is to be unfortunate, and misfortunes make us jealous. I thought you were earning a living in Tuscany or Piedmont by acting as Facchino or Cicerone, and I pitied you sincerely, as I would a child of my own. You know, I always did call you my child. Come, come. What then? Patience. Patience. I am patient, but go on. All at once I see you pass through the barrier with a groom, a tilbury, and fine new clothes. You must have discovered a mine, or else become a stockbroker. So that, as you confess, you are jealous? No, I am pleased. So pleased that I wish to congratulate you. But I am not quite properly dressed. I chose my opportunity that I might not compromise you. Yes, and a fine opportunity you have chosen, exclaimed Andrea. You speak to me before my servant. How can I help that, my boy? I speak to you when I can catch you. You have a quick horse, a light tilbury. You are naturally as slippery as an eel. If I had missed you tonight, I might not have had another chance. You see, I did not conceal myself. You are lucky. I wish I could say as much, for I do conceal myself, and then I was afraid you would not recognize me. But you did added Caruse, with his unpleasant smile. It was very polite of you. Come, said Andrea, what do you want? You do not speak affectionately to me, Benedetto, my old friend. That is not right. Take care, or I may become troublesome. This menace smothered the young man's passion. He urged the horse again into a trot. You should not speak so to an old friend like me, Carteruse, as you say just now. You are a native of Marseille. I am... Do you know then now what you are? No, but I was brought up in Corsica. You are old and obstinate. I am young and willful. Between people like us, threats are out of place. Everything should be amicably arranged. Is it my fault if fortune, which is frowned upon you, has been kind to me? Fortune has been kind to you, then. Your tilbury, your groom, your clothes are not then hired? Good. So much the better, said Caderousse, his eyes sparkling with avarice. Oh, you knew that well enough before speaking to me, said Andrea becoming more and more excited. If I had been wearing a handkerchief like yours on my head, rags on my back, and worn-out shoes on my feet, you would not have known me. You wrong me, my boy. 
Now I have found you. Nothing prevents my being as well-dressed as anyone, knowing, as I do, the goodness of your heart. If you have two coats, you will give me one of them. I used to divide my soup and beans with you when you were hungry. True, said Andrea. What an appetite you used to have. Is it as good now? Oh, yes, replied Andrea, laughing. How did you come to be dining with that prince whose house you have just left? He is not a prince, simply a count. A count? And a rich one, too, eh? Yes. But you had better not have anything to say to him, for he is not a very good-tempered gentleman. Oh, be easy. I have no design upon your count, and you shall have him all to yourself. But, said Caderousse, again smiling with the disagreeable expression he had before assumed, you must pay for it. You understand. Well, what do you want? I think that with a hundred francs a month. Well, I could live... Upon a hundred francs? Come, you understand me. But that with... With? With a hundred and fifty francs, I should be quite happy. Here are two hundred, said Andrea, as he placed ten gold louis in the hand of Carterousset. Good, said Carterousset. Apply to the steward on the first day of every month, and you will receive the same sum. There now, again you degrade me. How so? By making me apply to the servants, when I want to transact business with you alone. Well, be it so then. Take it from me then, and so long at least as I receive my income, you shall be paid yours. Come, come, I always said you were a fine fellow and it is a blessing when good fortune happens to such as you. But tell me all about it. Why do you wish to know? asked Cavalcanti. What? Do you again defy me? No. The fact is, I have found my father. What? A real father? Yes, so long as he pays me. You'll honor and believe him. That's right. What is his name? Major Cavalcanti. Is he pleased with you? So far, I have appeared to answer his purpose. And who found this father for you? The Count of Monte Cristo. The man whose house you have just left? Yes. I wish you would try to find me a situation with him as grandfather, since he holds the money chest. Well, I will mention you to him. Meanwhile, what are you going to do? I? Yes, you. It is very kind of you to trouble yourself about me. Since you interest yourself in my affairs, I think it is now my turn to ask you some questions. Ah, true. Well, I shall rent a room in some respectable house, wear a decent coat, shave every day, and go and read the paper in the café. Then, in the evening, I shall go to the theatre. I shall look like some retired baker. That is what I want. Come, if you will only put this scheme into execution and be steady, nothing could be better. Do you think so, M. Bosset? And you, what will become? A peer of France? Ah, said Andrea, who knows? Major Cavalcanti is already one, perhaps. But then, hereditary rank is abolished. No politics, Caderousse. And now that you have all you want, and that we understand each other, jump down from the Tilbury and disappear. Not at all, my good friend. How? Not at all? Why, just think for a moment. With this red handkerchief on my head, with scarcely any shoes, 
no papers, and ten gold Napoleons in my pocket, without reckoning what was there before, making in all about two hundred francs, why, I should certainly be arrested at the barriers. Then, to justify myself, I should say that you gave me the money. This would cause inquiries. It would be found that I left Toulon without giving due notice, and that I should then be escorted back to the shores of the Mediterranean. Then I should become simply number 106, and goodbye to my dream of resembling the retired baker. No, no, my boy, I prefer remaining honorably in the capital. Andrea scowled. Certainly, as he had himself owned, the reputed son of Major Cavalcanti was a willful fellow. He drew up for a minute, threw a rapid glance around him, and then his hand fell instantly into his pocket, where it began playing with a pistol. But, meanwhile, Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off his companion, passed his hand behind his back and opened a long Spanish knife, which he always carried with him, to be ready in case of need. The two friends, as we see, were worthy of and understood one another. Andrea's hand left his pocket inoffensively, and was carried up to the red moustache, which it played with for some time. Good, Caderousse, he said. How happy you will be. I will do my best, said the innkeeper of the Pont du Gard, shutting up his knife. Well, then, we will go to Paris. But how will you pass through the barrier without exciting suspicion? It seems to me that you are in more danger riding than on foot. Wait, said Caderousse, we shall see. He then took the great coat with the large collar which the groom had left behind in the tilbury, and put it on his back. Then he took off Cavalcanti's hat, which he placed upon his own head, and finally he assumed the careless attitude of a servant whose master drives himself. But tell me, said Andrea, am I to remain bareheaded? Pooh, said Caderousse, it is so windy that your hat can easily appear to have blown off. Come, come, enough of this, said Cavalcanti. What are you waiting for? said Caderousse. I hope I am not the cause. Hush! said Andrea. They passed the barrier without accident. At the first cross street, Andrea stopped his horse, and Caderousse leapt out. Well, said Andrea, my servant's coat and hat? Ah, said Caderousse, you would not like me to risk taking cold. But what am I to do? You? Oh, you are young, while I am beginning to get old. Au revoir, Benedetto. And running into a court, he disappeared. Alas, said Andrea, sighing, one cannot be completely happy in this world. End of chapter 64 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Paul Gabriel Weiner, East Brunswick, New Jersey, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 65 A Conjugal Scene. At the Place Louis the Fifteenth, the three young people separated. That is to say, Morel went to the boulevards, Chateau Renault to the Pont de la Révolution, and Debray to the Quai. Most probably Morel and Chateau Renault returned to their domestic horrors, as they say in the gallery of the chamber in well-turned speeches, and in the theatre of the Rue Richelieu in well-written pieces. But it was not the case with Debray. When he reached the wicket of the Louvre, he turned to the left, galloped across the carousel, passed through the Rue Saint-Roche, and, issuing from the Rue de la Michaudière, 
He arrived at Monsieur Danglars' door just at the same time that Villefort's Landau, after having deposited him and his wife at the Frauberg saint Honore, stopped to leave the baroness at her own house. Debray, with the air of a man familiar with the house, entered first into the court, threw his bridle into the hands of a footman, and returned to the door to receive Madame Danglars, to whom he offered his arm to conduct her to her apartments. The gate once closed, and Debray and the baroness alone in the court, he asked, "'What was the matter with you, Hermine, and why were you so affected at that story, or rather fable, which the Count related?' "'Because I have been in such shocking spirits all the evening, my friend,' said the baroness. "'No, Hermine,' replied Debray, "'you cannot make me believe that. On the contrary, you were in excellent spirits when you arrived at the Count's. Monsieur Danglars was disagreeable, certainly, but I know how much you care for his ill humor. Someone has vexed you. I will allow no one to annoy you. You are deceived, Lucien, I assure you, replied Madame Danglars, and what I have told you is really the case, added to the ill humor you remarked, but which I did not think it worth while to allude to. It was evident that Madame Danglars was suffering from that nervous irritability which women frequently cannot account for even to themselves or that, as Debray had guessed, she had experienced some secret agitation that she would not acknowledge to any one. Being a man who knew that the former of these symptoms was one of the inherent penalties of womanhood, he did not then press his inquiries, but waited for a more appropriate opportunity when he should again interrogate her, or receive an avowal proprio motu. At the door of her apartment the baroness met Mademoiselle Cornelie, her confidential maid. "'What is my daughter doing?' asked Madame Danglars. She practiced all the evening and then went to bed, replied Mademoiselle Cornelie. Yet I think I hear her piano. It is Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly, who is playing while Mademoiselle Danglars is in bed. Well, said Madame Danglars, come and undress me. They entered the bedroom. Debray stretched himself upon a large couch, and Madame Danglars passed into her dressing room with Mademoiselle Cornelie. My dear Monsieur Lucien, said Madame Danglars through the door, you are always complaining that Eugenie will not address a word to you. Madame, said Lucien, playing with a little dog, who, recognizing him as a friend of the house, expected to be caressed, I am not the only one who makes similar complaints. I think I heard Morcef say that he could not extract a word from his betrothed. True, said Madame Danglars, yet I think this will all pass off, and that you will one day see her enter your study. My study? At least that of the minister. Why so? To ask for an engagement at the opera. Really, I never saw such an infatuation for music. It is quite ridiculous for a young lady of fashion. Debray smiled. Well, said he, let her come, with your consent and that of the baron, and we will try to give her an engagement, though we are very poor to pay such talent as hers. Go, Cornelie, said Madame Danglars. I do not require you any longer. Cornelie obeyed, and the next minute Madame Danglars left her room in a charming loose dress, and came and sat down close to Debray. Then she began thoughtfully to caress the little spaniel. Lucien looked at her for a moment in silence. "'Come, Hermine,' he said after a short time. "'Answer candidly. Something vexes you. Is it not so?' "'Nothing,' answered the baroness. And yet, as she could scarcely breathe, she rose and went towards a looking-glass. I am frightful tonight, she said. Debray rose, smiling, and was about to contradict the baroness upon this latter point, when the door opened suddenly. Monsieur Danglars appeared. Debray reseated himself. At the noise of the door, Madame Danglars turned round and looked upon her husband with an astonishment she took no trouble to conceal. Good evening, madam, said the banker. Good evening, Monsieur Debray. Probably the baroness thought this unexpected visit signified a desire to make up for the sharp words he had uttered during the day. Assuming a dignified air, she turned round to Debray, without answering her husband. "'Read me something, Monsieur Debray,' she said. Debray, who was slightly disturbed at this visit, recovered himself when he saw the calmness of the baroness, and took up a book marked by a mother-of-pearl knife inlaid with gold. "'Excuse me,' said the banker. But you will tire yourself, Baroness, by such late hours, and Monsieur Debray lives some distance from here. Debray was petrified. 
not only to hear Danglar speak so calmly and politely, but because it was apparent that beneath outward politeness there really lurked a determined spirit of opposition to anything his wife might wish to do. The Baroness was also surprised, and showed her astonishment by a look which would doubtless have had some effect upon her husband if he had not been intently occupied with the paper, where he was looking to see the closing stock quotations. The result was that the proud look entirely failed of its purpose. "'Monsieur Lucien,' said the Baroness, "'I assure you I have no desire to sleep, and that I have a thousand things to tell you this evening, which you must listen to, even though you slept while hearing me. I am at your service, madam, replied Lucien coldly. My dear Monsieur Dupre, said the banker, do not kill yourself tonight listening to the follies of Madame Danglars, for you can hear them as well tomorrow. But I claim tonight, and will devote it, if you will allow me, to talk over some serious matters with my wife. This time the blow was so well aimed, and hit so directly, that Lucien and the Baroness were staggered, and they interrogated each other with their eyes, as if to seek help against this aggression. But the irresistible will of the master of the house prevailed, and the husband was victorious. "'Do not think I wish to turn you out, my dear Debray,' continued Danglars. "'Oh, no, not at all. An unexpected occurrence forces me to ask my wife to have a little conversation with me. It is so rarely I make such a request, I am sure you cannot grudge it to me." Debray muttered something, bowed, and went out, knocking himself against the edge of the door like Nathan and Athalie. "'It is extraordinary,' he said, when the door was closed behind him, "'how easily these husbands whom we ridicule gain an advantage over us.' Lucien having left, Danglars took his place on the sofa, closed the open book, and placing himself in a dreadfully dictatorial attitude, he began playing with the dog. But the animal, not liking him as well as Debray, and attempting to bite him, Danglars seized him by the skin of his neck and threw him upon the couch on the other side of the room. The animal uttered a cry during the transit, but, arrived at its destination, it crouched behind the cushions, and stupefied it at such unusual treatment, remained silent and motionless. "'Do you know, sir,' asked the Baroness, "'that you are improving? Generally you are only rude, but to-night you are brutal.' "'It is because I am in worse humor than usual,' replied Danglars. Hermine looked at the banker with supreme disdain. These glances frequently exasperate the pride of Danglars, but this evening he took no notice of them. "'And what have I to do with your ill-humor?' said the Baroness, irritated at the impassibility of her husband. "'Do these things concern me? Keep your ill-humor at home in your money-boxes, or, since you have clerks whom you pay, vent it upon them.' "'Not so,' replied Danglars. "'Your advice is wrong, so I shall not follow it. My money-boxes are my pactolus, as, I think, Monsieur de Mustier says, and I will not retard its course, or disturb its calm. My clerks are honest men, who earn my fortune, whom I pay much below their deserts, if I may value them according to what they bring in. Therefore I shall not get into a passion with them. Those with whom I will be in a passion are those who eat my dinners, mount my horses, and exhaust my fortune. And pray, who are the persons who exhaust your fortune? Explain yourself more clearly, I beg, sir. Oh, make yourself easy. I am not speaking in riddles, and you will soon know what I mean. The people who exhaust my fortune are those who draw out seven hundred thousand francs in the course of an hour. I do not understand you, sir, said the baroness, trying to disguise the agitation of her voice and the flush of her face. "'You understand me perfectly, on the contrary,' said Danglars. "'But, if you will persist, I will tell you that I have just lost seven hundred thousand francs upon the Spanish loan.' "'And pray,' asked the Baroness, "'am I responsible for this loss?' "'Why not? Is it my fault that you have lost seven hundred thousand francs?' "'Certainly it is not mine.' "'Once for all, sir,' replied the baroness sharply. "'I tell you I will not hear cash named. "'It is a style of language I never heard in the house of my parents, "'or in that of my first husband.' 
Oh, I can believe that, for neither of them was worth a penny. The better reason for my not being conversant with the slang of the bank, which is here dinning in my ears from morning to night, that noise of jingling crowns, which are constantly being counted and recounted, is odious to me. I know only one thing I dislike more, which is the sound of your voice. Really, said Danglars, well, this surprises me, for I thought you took the liveliest interest in all my affairs. I? What could put such an idea into your head? Yourself. Ah, uh, what next? Most assuredly. I should like to know upon what occasion. Oh, mon Dieu, that is very easily done. Last February you were the first who told me of the Haitian funds. You had dreamed that a ship had entered the harbor at Havre, that this ship brought news that a payment we had looked upon as lost was going to be made. I know how clear-sighted your dreams are. I therefore purchased immediately as many shares as I could of the Haitian debt, and I gained four hundred thousand francs by it, of which one hundred thousand have been honestly paid to you. You spent it as you pleased. That was your business. In March there was a question about a grant to a railway. Three companies presented themselves, each offering equal securities. You told me that your instinct, and although you pretend to know nothing about speculations, I think on the contrary that your comprehension is very clear upon certain affairs. Well, you told me that your instinct led you to believe that the grant would be given to the company called the Southern. I bought two-thirds of the shares of the company. As you had foreseen, the shares trebled in value, and I picked up a million, from which two hundred and fifty thousand francs were paid to you for pin money. Have you spent this two hundred and fifty thousand francs? It is no business of mine. When are you coming to the point? cried the baroness, shivering with anger and impatience. Patience, madam, I am coming to it. That's fortunate. In April you went to dine at the minister's. You heard a private conversation respecting Spanish affairs, on the expulsion of Don Carlos. I bought some Spanish shares. The expulsion took place, and I pocketed six hundred thousand francs the day Charles V repassed the Bidosa. Of those six hundred thousand francs, you took fifty thousand crowns. They were yours. You disposed of them according to your fancy, and I ask no questions. But it is not the less true that you have this year received five hundred thousand livres. Well, sir, and what then? Ah, yes. It was just after this that you spoiled everything. Really, your manner of speaking. It expresses my meaning, and that is all I want. Well, three days after you talked politics with Monsieur de Bray, and you fancied from his words that Don Carlos had returned to Spain. Well, I sold my shares. The news got out, and I no longer sold. I gave them away. Next day I find the news was false, and by this report I have lost seven hundred thousand francs. Well? Well, since I gave you a fourth of my gains, I think you owe me a fourth of my losses. The fourth of seven hundred thousand francs is one hundred and seventy-five thousand francs. What you say is absurd, and I cannot see why Monsieur de Bray's name is mixed up in this affair. Because, if you do not possess the hundred and seventy-five thousand francs I reclaim, you must have lent them to your friends, and Monsieur de Bray is one of your friends. For shame! exclaimed the baroness. Oh, let us have no gestures, no screams, no modern drama, or you will oblige me to tell you that I see Debray leave here, pocketing the whole of the five hundred thousand livres you have handed over to him this year, while he smiles to himself, saying that he has found what the most skillful players have never discovered, that is, a roulette wheel where he wins without paying, and is no loser when he loses. The baroness became enraged. Wretch! she cried. Will you dare to tell me that you did not know what you now reproach me with? I do not say that I did know it, and I do not say that I did not know it. 
I merely tell you to look into my conduct during the last four years that we have ceased to be husband and wife, and see whether it has not always been consistent. Some time after our rupture you wished to study music under the celebrated baritone who made such a successful appearance at the Théâtre Italienne. At the same time I felt inclined to learn dancing of the danseuses who acquired such a reputation in London. This cost me, on your account and mine, a hundred thousand francs. I said nothing, for we must have peace in the house, and a hundred thousand francs for a lady and gentleman to be properly instructed in music and dancing are not too much. Well, you soon became tired of singing, and you take a fancy to study diplomacy with the minister's secretary. You understand, it signifies nothing to me so long as you pay for your lessons out of your own cash box. But today I find you are drawing on mine, and that your apprenticeship may cost me seven hundred thousand francs per month. Stop there, madam, for this cannot last. Either the diplomatist must give his lessons gratis, and I will tolerate him, or he must never set his foot again in my house. Do you understand, madame? Oh! This is too much, cried Hermine, choking. You are worse than despicable. But, continued Danglars, I find you do not even pause there. Insults! You are right. Let us leave these facts alone and reason coolly. I have never interfered in your affairs excepting for your good. Treat me in the same way. You say you have nothing to do with my cash box? Be it so. Do as you like with your own, but do not fill or empty mine. Besides, how do I know that this was not a political trick, that the minister, enraged at seeing me in the opposition, and jealous of the popular sympathy I excite, has not concerted with Monsieur de Bray to ruin me? A probable thing. Why not? Who ever heard of such an occurrence as this? A false telegraphic dispatch. It is almost impossible for wrong signals to be made as they were in the last two telegrams. It was done on purpose for me. I am sure of it. Sir, said the baroness humbly, are you not aware that the man employed there was dismissed, that they talked of going to law with him, that orders were issued to arrest him, and that this order would have been put into execution if he had not escaped by flight, which proves that he was either mad or guilty? It was a mistake. Yes, which made fools laugh, which caused the minister to have a sleepless night, which has caused the minister's secretaries to blacken several sheets of paper, but which has cost me seven hundred thousand francs. But, sir, Hermine said suddenly, if all this is, as you say, caused by Monsieur Dupre, why, instead of going direct to him, do you come to me and tell me of it? Why, to accuse the man, do you address the woman? Do I know Monsieur Dubray? Do I wish to know him? Do I wish to know that he gives advice? Do I wish to follow it? Do I speculate? No, you do all this, not I. Still, it seems to me that as you profit by it... Danglars shrugged his shoulders. Foolish creature, he exclaimed. Women fancy they have talent because they have managed two or three intrigues without being the talk of Paris. But know that if you had even hidden your irregularities from your husband, who has but the commencement of the art, for generally husbands will not see, you would then have been but a faint imitation of most of your friends among the women of the world. But it has not been so with me. I see, and have always seen, during the last sixteen years. You may, perhaps, have hidden a thought, but not a step, not an action, not a fault has escaped me, while you flattered yourself upon your address, and firmly believe you had deceived me. What has been the result? That, thanks to my pretended ignorance, there is none of your friends, from Monsieur de Villefort to Monsieur de Pre, who has not trembled before me. There is not one who has not treated me as master of the house the only title I desire with respect to you. There is not one, in fact, who would have dared to speak of me as I have spoken of them this day. 
I will allow you to make me hateful, but I will prevent your rendering me ridiculous, and, above all, I forbid you to ruin me. The Baroness had been tolerably composed until the name of Villefort had been pronounced, but then she became pale, and, rising as if touched by a spring, she stretched out her hands as though conjuring an apparition. She then took two or three steps towards her husband, as though to tear the secret from him, of which he was ignorant, or which he withheld from some odious calculation, odious as all his calculations were. Monsieur de Villefort, what do you mean? I mean that Monsieur de Nargon, your first husband, being neither a philosopher nor a banker, or perhaps being both, and seeing there was nothing to be got out of a king's attorney, died of grief or anger at finding, after an absence of nine months, that you had been on at six. I am brutal. I not only allow it, but boast of it. It is one of the reasons of my success in the commercial business. Why did he kill himself instead of you? Because he had no cash to save. My life belongs to my cash. Monsieur de Bray has made me lose seven hundred thousand francs. Let him bear his share of the loss, and we will go on as before. If not, let him become bankrupt for the two hundred and fifty thousand livres, and do as all bankrupts do, disappear. He is a charming fellow, I allow, when his news is correct. But when it is not, there are fifty others in the world who would do better than he. Madame Danglars was rooted to the spot. She made a violent effort to reply to this last attack, but she fell upon a chair thinking of Villefort, of the dinner scene, of the strange series of misfortunes which had taken place in her house during the last few days, and changed the usual calm of her establishment to a scene of scandalous debate. Danglars did not even look at her, though she did her best to faint. He shut the bedroom door after him, without adding another word, and returned to his apartments and when Madame Danglars recovered from her half-fainting condition, she could almost believe that she had had a disagreeable dream. End of chapter 65「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 66 Matrimonial Projects The day following this scene, at the hour the banker usually chose to pay a visit to Madame Danglars on his way to his office, his coupé did not appear. At this time, that is, about half past twelve, Madame Danglars ordered her carriage and went out. Danglars, hidden behind a curtain, watched the departure he had been waiting for. He gave orders that he should be informed as soon as Madame Danglars appeared. But at two o'clock she had not returned. He then called for his horses, drove to the chamber, and inscribed his name to speak against the budget. From twelve to two o'clock, Danglars had remained in his study, unsealing his dispatches, and becoming more and more sad every minute, heaping figure upon figure, and receiving, among other visits, one from Mayor Cavalcanti, who, as stiff and exact as ever, presented himself precisely at the hour named the night before to terminate his business with the banker. On leaving the chamber, Danglars, who had shown violent marks of agitation during the sitting, and been more bitter than ever against the ministry, re-entered his carriage, and told the coachman to drive to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, number 30. Monte Cristo was at home. Only he was engaged with someone, and begged Danglars to wait for a moment in the drawing-room. While the banker was waiting in the anteroom, the door opened, and a man dressed as an abbé, and doubtless more familiar with the house than he was, came in and instead of waiting merely bowed passed on to the further apartments and disappeared a minute after the door by which the priest had entered reopened and monte cristo appeared pardon me he said my dear baron but one of my friends the abbe busoni whom you perhaps saw pass by has just arrived in paris 
not having seen him for a long time, I could not make up my mind to leave him sooner, so I hope this will be sufficient reason for my having made you wait. Nay, said Danglars, it is my fault. I have chosen my visit at a wrong time, and I will retire. Not at all. On the contrary, be seated. But what is the matter with you? You look careworn. Really, you alarm me. Melancholy is a capitalist, like the appearance of a comet, presages some misfortune to the world. I have been in ill luck for several days, said Danglars, and I have heard nothing but bad news. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo. Have you had another fall at the Bourse? No, I am safe for a few days at least. I am only annoyed about a bankrupt of Trieste. Really? Does it happen to be Jacopo Manfredi? Exactly so. Imagine a man who has transacted business with me for I don't know how long, to the amount of 800,000 or 900,000 francs during the year, never a mistake or delay. A fellow who paid like a prince. Well, I was a million in advance with him, and now my fine Jacopo Manfredi suspends payment. Really? It is an unheard of fatality. I draw upon him for 600,000 francs. My bills are returned and paid. I hold bills of exchange signed by him to the value of 400,000 francs, payable at his correspondence in Paris at the end of this month. Today is the 30th. I present them, but my correspondent has disappeared. This, with my Spanish affairs, made a pretty end to the month. Then you really lost by that affair in Spain? Yes, only 700,000 francs out of my cash box, nothing more. Why, how could you make such a mistake, such an old stagger? Oh, it's all my wife's fault. She dreamed Don Carlos had returned to Spain. She believes in dreams. It is magnetism, she says. And when she dreams a thing, it is true to happen, she assures me. On this conviction, I allow her to speculate. She have in her bank and her stockbrokers, she speculated and lost. It is true she speculates with her own money, not mine. Nevertheless, you can understand that when 700,000 francs leave the wife's pocket, the husband always find it out. But do you mean to say you have not heard of this? Why, the thing has made a tremendous noise. Yes, I heard it spoken of, but I did not know the details. And then, no one can be more ignorant than I am of the affairs in the bourse. Then you do not speculate? I? How could I speculate when I already have so much trouble in regulating my income? I should be obliged, besides my steward, to keep a clerk and a boy. But touching these Spanish affairs, I think that the Baroness did not dream the whole of the Don Carlos matter. The papers said something about it, did they not? Then you believe the papers? Aye, not the least in the world. Only I fancied that the honest messenger was an exception to the rule, and that it only announced telegraphic dispatches. Well, that's what puzzles me, replied Dongla. The news of the return of Don Carlo was brought by telegraph. So that, said Monte Cristo, you have lost nearly one million seven hundred thousand francs this month. Not nearly, indeed. That is exactly my loss. Diable, said Monte Cristo compassionately. It is a hard blow for a third-rate fortune. Third-rate, said Danglars, rather humble. What do you mean by that? Certainly, continued Monte Cristo. I make three assortments of fortune. First-rate, second-rate, and third-rate fortunes. I call those first-rate, which are composed of treasures one possesses under one's hand, such as mines, lands, and funded property, in such states as France, Austria, and England, provided these treasures and property form a total of about a hundred millions. I call those second-rate fortunes that are gained by manufacturing enterprises, joint stock companies, vice royalties, and principalities. Not drawing more than 1,500,000 francs, the whole forming a capital of about 50 millions. Finally, I call those third-rate fortunes, which are composed of a fluctuating capital, 
dependent upon the will of others, or upon changes which a bankruptcy involves, or a false telegram shakes, such as banks, speculations of the day. In fact, all operations under the influence of greater or less mischances, the whole bringing in real or fictitious capital of about fifteen millions. I think this is about your position, is it not? Confound it, yes, replied Danglars. The result, then, of six more such months as this would be to reduce the third-rate house to despair. Oh, said Danglars, becoming very pale, how you are right running on. Let us imagine seven such months, continued Monte Cristo in the same tone. Tell me, have you ever thought that seven times one million seven hundred thousand francs make nearly twelve millions? No, you have not. Well, you are right, for if you indulged in such reflections, you would never risk your principle, which is to the speculator what the skin is to civilized men. We have our clothes, some more splendid than others. This is our credit. But when a man dies, he has only his skin. In the same way, on retiring from business, you have nothing but your real principle, of about five or six millions at the most, for third-rate fortunes are never more than a fourth of what they appear to be, like the locomotive of a railway, the size of which is magnified by the smoke and steam surrounding it. Well, out of the five or six millions which form your real capital, you have just lost nearly two millions, which must, of course, in the same degree diminish your credit and fictitious fortune. To follow out my simile, your skin has been opened by bleeding, and this, if repeated three or four times, will cause death. So pay attention to it, my dear Monsieur Danglars. Do you want money? Do you wish me to lend you some? What a bad calculator you are! exclaimed Danglars call into his assistance all his philosophy and dissimulation. I have made money at the same time by speculations which have succeeded. I have made up the loss of blood by nutrition. I lost a battle in Spain. I have been defeated in Trieste. But my naval army in India will have taken some galleons, and my Mexican pioneers will have discovered some mine. Very good, very good but the wound remains, and will reopen at the first loss. No, for I am only embarked in certainties, replied Danglars, with the air of a mountebank sounding his own praises. To involve me, three governments must crumble to dust. Well, such things have been, that there should be a famine. Recollect the seven fat and the seven lean kine, or that the sea should become dry, as the day of Pharaoh, and even then my vessels would become caravans. So much the better. I congratulate you, my dear Monsieur Danglars, said Monte Cristo. I see I was deceived, and that you belong to the class of second-rate fortunes. I think I may aspire to that honour, said Danglars with a smile, which reminded Monte Cristo of the sickly moons which bad artists are so fond of daubing into their pictures of ruins. But while we are speaking of business, Danglars added, pleased to find an opportunity of changing the subject, tell me, what am I to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti? Give him money if he is recommended to you, and the recommendation seems good. Excellent. He presented himself this morning with a bound of 40,000 francs, payable at sight on you, signed by Busoni, and returned by you to me, with your endorsement. Of course, I immediately counted him over the forty banknotes. Monte Cristo nodded his head in token of assent. But that is not all, continued Danglars. He has opened an account with my house for his son. May I ask how much he allows the young man? Five thousand francs per month. Sixty thousand francs per year. I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanti to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousands more, do not advance it. The father will never repay it. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. 
they are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but nevertheless, mind you hold to the terms of the agreement. Would you not trust the Cavalcanti? I? Oh, I would advance six millions on his signature. I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is! I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere mayor. And you would have flattered him, for certainly, as you say, he has no manner. The first time I saw him, he appeared to me like an old lieutenant who had grown mildly under his epaulets. But all the Italians are the same. They are like all Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendor. The young man is better, said Danglars. Yes, a little nervous, perhaps, but upon the whole, he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why? Because you met him at my house, just after his introduction into the world, as they told me. He has been travelling with a very severe tutor, and had never been to Paris before. Ah, uh, I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves. Do they not? asked Tongla carelessly. They like to unite their fortunes. It is usual, certainly. But Cavalcanti is an original who does nothing like other people. I cannot help thinking that he had brought his son to France to choose a wife. Do you think so? I'm sure of it. And you have heard his fortune mentioned? Nothing else was talked of. Only some said he was worth millions, and others that he did not possess a farting. And what is your opinion? I owe not to influence you, because it is only my own personal impression. Well, and it is that? My opinion is that all these old podestas, these ancient condottieri, for the Cavalcanti have commanded armies and governed provinces, my opinion, I say, is that they have buried their millions in corners, the secret of which they have transmitted only to their eldest sons, who have done the same from generation to generation, and the proof of this is seen in their yellow and dry appearance, like the florins of the Republic, which from being constantly gazed upon have become reflected in them. Certainly, said Danglars, and this is further supported by the fact of their not possessing an inch of land. Very little at least. I know of none which Cavalcanti possesses, except in his palace in Lucia. Ah, he has a palace, said Danglars, laughing. Come, that is something. Yes, and more than that. He lets it to the Minister of Finance, while he lives in the simple house. Oh, as I told you before, I think the old fellow is very close. Come, you do not flatter him. I scarcely know him. I think I have seen him three times in my life. All I know relating to him is through Busoni and himself. He was telling me this morning that, tired of letting his property lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead nation, he wished to find the method, either in France or England, of multiplying his millions. But remember that though I place great confidence in Busoni, I am not responsible for this. Never mind. Accept my thanks for the client you have sent me. It is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers, and my cashier was quite proud of it when I explained to him who the Cavalcanti were. By the way, this is merely a simple question. When this sort of people marry their sons, do they give them any fortune? Ah, that depends upon circumstances. I know an Italian prince, rich as a gold mine, one of the noblest families in Tuscany, who, when his sons married according to his wish, gave them millions, and when they married against his consent, merely allowed them thirty crowns a month. Should André marry according to his father's views, he will perhaps give him one, two, or three millions. For example, supposing it were the daughter of a banker, 
he might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son. Then again, if he dislikes his choice, the mayor takes the key, double locks his coffer, and Master Andrea would be obliged to live like the sons of a Parisian family, by shuffling cards or rattling the dice. Oh, that boy will find out some Bavarian or Peruvian princess. He will want a crown and an immense fortune. No, these grand lords of the other side of the Alps frequently marry into plain families. Like Jupiter, they like to cross the race. But do you wish to marry Andrea, my dear Monsieur Danglars, that you are asking so many questions? Ma foi, said Danglars. It would not be a bad speculation, I fancy, and you know I'm a speculator. You are not thinking of Mademoiselle Danglars, I hope. You would not like poor Andrea to have his throat cut by Albert. Albert, repeated Danglars, shrugging his shoulders. Ah, well, he would care very little about it, I think. But he is betrothed to your daughter, I believe. Well, Monsieur de Morcerf and I have talked about this marriage. But Madame de Morcerf and Albert... You do not mean to say that it would not be a good match. Indeed, I imagine that Mademoiselle Danglars is as good as Monsieur de Morcerf. Mademoiselle Danglars' fortune would be great, no doubt, especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes. Oh, I do not mean her fortune only, but tell me. What? Why did you not invite Monsieur and Madame de Morcerf to your dinner? I did so, but he excused himself on account of Madame de Morcerf being obliged to go to Dieppe for the benefit of sea air. Yes, yes, <laughs> said Danglars, laughing. It would do her a great deal of good. Why so? Because it is the air she always breathed in her youth. Monte Cristo took no notice of this ill-natured remark. But still, if Albert is not so rich as Mademoiselle Danglars, said the Count, you must allow that he has a fine name. So he has, but I like mine as well. Certainly, your name is popular and does honor to the title they have adorned it with. But you are too intelligent not to know that according to a prejudice too firmly rooted to be exterminated, a nobility which dates back five centuries is worth more than one that can only recon twenty years. And for this very reason, said Danglars with a smile, which he tried to make sardonic, I prefer Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti to Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Still, I should not think de Morcerf would yield to the Cavalcanti. De Morcerf, stay, my dear Count, said Danglars. You are a man of the world, are you not? I think so. And you understand heraldry? A little. Well, look at my coat of arms. It is worth more than Morcerf's. Why so? Because, though I'm not a baron by birth, my real name is at least Danglars. Well, what then? While his name is not Morcerf. How? Not Morcerf? Not the least in the world. Go on. I have been made a baron, so that I actually am one. He made himself a count, so that he is not one at all. Impossible. Listen, my dear count, Monsieur de Morcerf has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility, or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcerf was a mere fisherman. And then he was called... Fernand. Only Fernand? Fernand Mondigo. You are sure? Pardieu, I have bought enough fish of him to know his name. Then why did you think of giving your daughter to him? Because Fernand and Danglars, being both parvenus, both having become noble, both rich, are about equal in worth, excepting that there have been certain things mentioned of him that were never said of me. What? Oh, nothing. Ah, yes. 
What you tell me recalls to mind something about the name of Fernand Mondego. I have heard that name in Greece. In conjecture with the affairs of Ali Pasha? Exactly so. This is the mystery, said Danglars. I acknowledge I would have given anything to find it out. It would be very easy if you much wished it. How so? Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. I should think so. At Yanina? Everywhere. Well, write to your correspondent in Yanina and ask him what part was played by a Frenchman named Fernand Mondego in the catastrophe of Ali Tepelini. You are right, exclaimed Danglars, rising quickly. I will write today. Do so. I will. And if you should hear of anything very scandalous, I will communicate it to you. You will oblige me. Danglars rushed out of the room and made but one leap into his coupé. End of chapter 66「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Dan Three Trees. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 67. At the Office of the King's Attorney. Let us leave the banker driving his horses at their fullest speed and follow Madame Danglars in her morning excursion. We have said that at half past twelve o'clock Madame Danglars had ordered her horses and had left home in the carriage. She directed her course toward the Faubourg Saint-Germain, went down the Rue Mazarine, and stopped at the Passage du Pont Neuf. She descended, and went through the passage. She was very plainly dressed, as would be the case with a woman of taste walking in the morning. At the Rue Gunagod she called a cab, and directed the driver to go to the Rue de Harlay. As soon as she was seated in the vehicle, she drew from her pocket a very thick black veil which she tied on to her straw bonnet. She then replaced the bonnet, and saw with pleasure, in a little pocket mirror, that her white complexion and brilliant eyes were alone visible. The cab crossed the Pont Neuf and entered the Rue de Harlay by the Place Dauphine. The driver was paid as the door opened, and stepping lightly up the stairs, Madame Danglars soon reached the Salle de Pas Perdu. There was a great deal going on that morning, and many business-like persons at the Palais Business-like persons pay very little attention to women, and Madame Danglars crossed the hall without exciting any more attention than any other woman calling upon her lawyer. There was a great press of people in Monsieur de Villefort's antechamber, but Madame Danglars had no occasion even to pronounce her name. The instant she appeared, the doorkeeper rose, came to her, and asked her whether she was not the person with whom the procureur had made an appointment, and on her affirmative answer being given, he conducted her by a private passage to Monsieur de Villefort's office. The magistrate was seated in an armchair, writing, with his back towards the door. He did not move as he heard it open, and the doorkeeper pronounced the words, Walk in, madame, and then reclose it. But no sooner had the man's footsteps ceased than he started up, drew the bolts, closed the curtains, and examined every corner of the room. Then, when he had assured himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and was consequently relieved of doubts, he said, Thanks, madame, thanks for your punctuality. And he offered a chair to madame Danglars, which she accepted, for her heart beat so violently that she felt nearly suffocated. It is a long time, madame, said the procureur, describing a half circle with his chair so as to place himself exactly opposite to madame Danglars. It is a long time since I had the pleasure of speaking alone with you, and I regret that we have only now met to enter upon a painful conversation. Nevertheless, sir, you see I have answered your first appeal, although certainly the conversation must be much more painful for me than for you. Villefort smiled bitterly. It is true, then, he said, rather uttering his thoughts aloud than addressing his companion. It is true, then, that all our actions leave their traces, some sad, some bright, on our paths. It is true that every step in our lives is like the course of an insect on the sands. It leaves its track. Alas, to many the path is traced by tears. Sir, said Madame Danglars, you can feel for my emotion, can you not? Spare me then, I beseech you. When I look at this room, 
whence so many guilty creatures have departed, trembling and ashamed, when I look at that chair before which I now sit trembling and ashamed. Oh, it requires all my reason to convince me that I am not a very guilty woman and you a menacing judge. Villefort dropped his head and sighed, and I, he said, I feel that my place is not in the judge's seat, but on the prisoner's stool. You, said Madame Danglars. Yes, I. I think, sir, you exaggerate your situation, said Madame Danglars, whose beautiful eyes sparkled for a moment. The paths of which you were just speaking have been traced by all young men of ardent imaginations. Besides the pleasure, there is always remorse from the indulgence of our passions, and after all, what have you men to fear from all this? The world excuses and notoriety ennobles you. Madame, replied Villefort, you know that I am no hypocrite, or at least that I never deceive without a reason. If my brow be severe, it is because many misfortunes have clouded it. If my heart be petrified, it is that it might sustain the blows it has received. I was not so in my youth. I was not so on the night of the betrothal, when we were all seated around a table in the Rue de Cœur at Marseilles. But since then, everything has changed in and about me. I am accustomed to brave difficulties, and in the conflict to crush those who, by their own free will, or by chance, voluntarily or involuntarily, interfere with me in my career. It is generally the case that what we most ardently desire is as ardently withheld from us by those who wish to obtain it, or from whom we attempt to snatch it. Thus, the greater number of a man's errors come before him disguised under the specious form of necessity, then after error has been committed in a moment of excitement, of delirium, or of fear, we see that we might have avoided and escaped it. The means we might have used, which we in our blindness could not see, then seem simple and easy, and we say, why did I not do this instead of that? Women, on the contrary, are rarely tormented with remorse, for the decision does not come from you. Your misfortunes are generally imposed upon you, and your faults the results of others' crimes. In any case, sir, you will allow, replied Madame Danglars, that even if the fault were mine alone, I last night received a severe punishment for it. Poor thing, said Villefort, pressing her hand. It was too severe for your strength, for you were twice overwhelmed, and yet... Well? Well, I must tell you, collect all your courage, for you have not yet heard all. Ah! exclaimed Madame d'Aglar, alarmed. What is there more to hear? You only look back to the past, and it is indeed bad enough. Well, picture to yourself a future more gloomy still, certainly frightful, perhaps sanguinary. The Baroness knew how calm Villefort naturally was, and his present excitement frightened her so much that she opened her mouth to scream, but the sound died in her throat. How has this terrible past been recalled? cried Villefort. How is it that it has escaped from the depths of the tomb and the recesses of our hearts where it was buried, to visit us now like a phantom, whitening our cheeks and flushing our brows with shame? Alas! said Hermine. Doubtless it is chance. Chance, replied Villefort. No, no, madame, there is no such thing as chance. Oh, yes, has not a fatal chance revealed all this? Was it not by chance the Count of Monte Cristo bought that house? Was it not by chance he caused the earth to be dug up? Is it not by chance that the unfortunate child was disinterred under the trees, that poor innocent offspring of mine which I never even kissed? but for whom I wept many, many tears. Ah, my heart clung to the Count when he mentioned the dear spoil found beneath the flowers. Well, no, madame. This is the terrible news I have to tell you, said Villefort in a hollow voice. No, nothing was found beneath the flowers. There was no child disinterred. No, you must not weep. No, you must not groan. You must tremble. What can you mean? asked Madame Danglars, shuddering. I mean that Monsieur de Monte Cristo, digging underneath these trees, found neither skeleton nor chest, because neither of them was there. Neither of them there? repeated Madame Danglars, her staring wide open eyes expressing her alarm. Neither of them there, she said again, as though striving to impress herself with the meaning of the words which escaped her. No, said Villefort, burying his face in his hands, no, a hundred times no. Then you did not bury the poor child there, sir? 
Why did you deceive me? Where did you place it? Tell me where. There. But listen to me, listen. And you will pity me who has for 20 years alone borne the heavy burden of grief I am about to reveal without casting the least portion upon you. Oh, you frighten me, but speak, I will listen. You recollect that sad night when you were half expiring on that bed in the red damask room while I, scarcely less agitated than you, awaited your delivery. The child was born, was given to me, motionless, breathless, voiceless. We thought it dead. Madame Danglars moved rapidly, as though she would spring from her chair, but Villefort stopped and clasped his hands as if to implore her attention. We thought it dead, he repeated. I placed it in the chest, which was to take the place of a coffin. I descended to the garden, I dug a hole, and then flung it down in haste. Scarcely had I covered it with earth, when the arm of the Corsican was stretched towards me. I saw a shadow rise, and at the same time a flash of light. I felt pain. I wished to cry out, but an icy shiver ran through my veins and stifled my voice. I felt lifeless, and fancied myself killed. Never shall I forget your sublime courage when, having returned to consciousness, I dragged myself to the foot of the stairs, and you, almost dying yourself, came to meet me. We were obliged to keep silent upon the dreadful catastrophe. You had the fortitude to regain the house, assisted by your nurse. A duel was the pretext for my wound. Though we scarcely expected it, our secret remained in our own keeping alone. I was taken to Versailles. For three months I struggled with death. At last, as I seemed to cling to life, I was ordered to the south. Four men carried me from Paris to Chalons, walking six leagues a day. Madame de Villefort followed the litter in her carriage. At Chalons I was put upon the Seine. Thence I passed on to the Rhone, whence I descended, merely with the current, to Arles. At Arles, I was again placed on my litter and continued my journey to Marseille. My recovery lasted six months. I never heard you mentioned, and I did not dare inquire for you. When I returned to Paris, I learned that you, the widow of Monsieur de Nargonne, had married Monsieur Danglars. What was the subject of my thoughts from the time consciousness returned to me? Always the same, always the child's corpse, coming every night in my dreams, rising from the earth and hovering over the grave with menacing look and gesture. I inquired immediately on my return to Paris. The house had not been inhabited since we left it, but it had just been let for nine years. I found the tenant. I pretended that I disliked the idea that a house belonging to my wife's father and mother should pass into the hands of strangers. I offered to pay them for cancelling the lease. They demanded 6,000 francs. I would have given 10,000. I would have given 20,000. I had the money with me. I made the tenant sign the deed of resolution, and when I had obtained what I so much wanted, I galloped to Ote. No one had entered the house since I had left it. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. I ascended into the red room and waited for night. There all the thoughts which had disturbed me during my year of constant agony came back with double force. The Corsican, who had declared the vendetta against me, who had followed me from Nîmes to Paris, who had hid himself in the garden, who had struck me, had seen me dig the grave, had seen me inter the child. He might become acquainted with your person, nay, he might even then have known it. Would he not one day make you pay for keeping this terrible secret? Would it not be a sweet revenge for him when he found that I had not died from the blow of his dagger? It was therefore necessary, before everything else, and at all risks, that I should cause all traces of the past to disappear, that I should destroy every material vestige. Too much reality would always remain in my recollection. It was for this I had annulled the lease. It was for this I had come. It was for this I was waiting. Night arrived. I allowed it to become quite dark. I was without a light in that room. When the wind shook all the doors, behind which I continually expected to see some spy concealed, I trembled. I seemed everywhere to hear your moans behind me in the bed and I dared not turn around. My heart beat so violently that I feared my wound would open. At length, one by one, all the noises in the neighborhood ceased. I understood that I had nothing to fear, that I should neither be seen nor heard, so I decided upon descending to the garden. Listen, Hermine, I consider myself as brave as most men, but when I drew from my breast the little key of the staircase, which I had found in my coat, that little key we both used to cherish so much, 
which you wished to have fastened to a golden ring. When I opened the door and saw the pale moon shedding a long stream of white light on the spiral staircase like a specter, I leaned against the wall and nearly shrieked. I seemed to be going mad. At last I mastered my agitation. I descended the staircase step by step. The only thing I could not conquer was a strange trembling in my knees. I grasped the railings. If I had relaxed my hold for a moment, I should have fallen. I reached the lower door. Outside this door, a spade was placed against the wall. I took it and advanced towards the thicket. I had provided myself with a dark lantern. In the middle of the lawn, I stopped to light it. Then I continued my path. It was the end of November. All the verdure of the garden had disappeared. The trees were nothing more than skeletons with their long bony arms, and the dead leaves sounded on the gravel under my feet. My terror overcame me to such a degree as I approached the thicket that I took a pistol from my pocket and armed myself. I fancied continually that I saw the figure of the Corsican between the branches. I examined the thicket with my dark lantern. It was empty. I looked carefully around. I was indeed alone. No noise disturbed the silence but an owl, whose piercing cry seemed to be calling up the phantoms of the night. I tied my lantern to a forked branch I had noticed a year before at the precise spot where I had stopped to dig the hole. The grass had grown very thickly there during the summer, and when autumn arrived no one had been there to mow it. Still, one place where the grass was thin attracted my attention. It evidently was there I had turned up the ground. I went to work. The hour then, for which I had been waiting during the last year, had at length arrived. How I worked, how I hoped, how I struck every piece of turf, thinking to find some resistance to my spade. But no, I found nothing though I had made a hole twice as large as the first. I thought I had been deceived, had mistaken the spot. I turned around, I looked at the trees, I tried to recall the details which had struck me at the time. A cold, sharp wind whistled through the leafless branches, and yet the drops fell from my forehead. I recollected that I was stabbed just as I was trampling the ground to fill up the hole. While doing so, I had leaned against a laburnum. Behind me was an artificial rockery intended to serve as a resting place for persons walking in the garden. In falling, my hand, relaxing its hold of the laburnum, felt the coldness of the stone. On my right I saw the tree, behind me the rock. I stood in the same attitude and threw myself down. I rose, and again began digging and enlarging the hole. Still I found nothing, nothing. The chest was no longer there. The chest no longer there, murmured Madame Danglars, choking with fear. Think not I contented myself with this one effort, continued Villefort. No, I searched the whole thicket. I thought the assassin, having discovered the chest and supposing it to be a treasure, had intended carrying it off, but, perceiving his error, had dug another hole and deposited it there, but I could find nothing. Then the idea struck me that he had not taken these precautions and had simply thrown it in a corner. In the last case I must wait for daylight to renew my search. I remained in the room and waited. Oh, heavens! When daylight dawned, I went down again. My first visit was to the thicket. I hoped to find some traces which had escaped me in the darkness. I had turned up the earth over a surface of more than twenty feet square and a depth of two feet. A laborer would not have done in a day what occupied me an hour, but I could find nothing, absolutely nothing. Then I renewed the search, supposing it had been thrown aside. It would probably be on the path which led to the little gate but this examination was as useless as the first, and with a bursting heart I returned to the thicket, which now contained no hope for me. Oh, cried Madame Danglars, it was enough to drive you mad. I hoped for a moment that it might, said Villefort, but that happiness was denied me. However, recovering my strength and my ideas, why, said I, should that man have carried away the corpse? But you said, replied Madame Danglars, he would require it as a proof. Ah, no, Madame, that could not be. Dead bodies are not kept a year. They are shown to a magistrate, and the evidence is taken. Now nothing of the kind has happened. What then? asked Hermine, trembling violently. Something more terrible, more fatal, more alarming for us. The child was, perhaps, alive, and the assassin may have saved it. Madame Danglars uttered a piercing cry, and, seizing Villefort's hands, exclaimed, "'My child was alive?' 
said she. You buried my child alive? You were not certain my child was dead and you buried it? Ah! Oh. Madame Danglars had risen and stood before the procureur, whose hands she wrung in her feeble grasp. I know not. I merely suppose so, as I might suppose anything else, replied Villefort with a look so fixed it indicated that his powerful mind was on the verge of despair and madness. Ah, my child, my poor child, cried the baroness, falling on her chair and stifling her sobs in her handkerchief. Villefort, becoming somewhat reassured, perceived that to avert the maternal storm gathering over his head, he must inspire Madame Danglars with the terror he felt. You understand, then, that if it were so, said he, rising in his turn and approaching the baroness to speak to her in a lower tone, we are lost. This child lives, and someone knows it lives. Someone is in possession of our secret. And since Monte Cristo speaks before us of a child disinterred, when that child could not be found, it is he who is in possession of our secret. Just God, avenging God, murmured Madame Danglars. Villefort's only answer was a stifled groan. But the child, the child, sir, repeated the agitated mother. How I have searched for him, replied Villefort, wringing his hands. How I have called him in my long sleepless nights. How I have longed for royal wealth to purchase a million of secrets from a million of men and to find mine among them. At last, one day, when for the hundredth time I took up my spade, I asked myself again and again what the Corsican could have done with the child. A child encumbers a fugitive. Perhaps, on perceiving it was still alive, he had thrown it into the river. Impossible, cried Madame Danglars. A man may murder another out of revenge, but he would not deliberately drown a child. Perhaps, continued Villefort, he had put it in the foundling hospital. Oh, yes, yes, cried the baroness. My child is there. I ran to the hospital and learned that the same night, the night of the 20th of September, a child had been brought there, wrapped in part of a fine linen napkin, purposely torn in half. This portion of the napkin was marked with half a baron's crown and the letter H. Truly, truly, said Madame Danglars, all my linen is marked thus. Monsieur de Nargon was a baronet and my name is Hermine. Thank God my child was not then dead. No, it was not dead. And can you tell me so without fearing to make me die of joy? Where is the child? Villefort shrugged his shoulders. Do I know, said he, and do you believe that if I knew, I would relate to you all its trials and all its adventures as would a dramatist or a novel writer? Alas, no, I know not. A woman about six months after came to claim it with the other half of the napkin. This woman gave all the requisite particulars, and it was entrusted to her. But you should have inquired for the woman, you should have traced her. And what do you think I did? I feigned a criminal process and employed all the most acute bloodhounds and skillful agents in search of her. They traced her to Chalon, and there they lost her. They lost her? Yes, forever. Madame Danglars had listened to this recital with a sigh, a tear, or a shriek for every detail. And this is all? said she. And you stop there? Oh, no, said Villefort. I never ceased to search and to inquire. However, the last two or three years I had allowed myself some respite, but now I will begin with more perseverance and fury than ever, since fear urges me not my conscience. But, replied Madame Danglars, the Count of Monte Cristo can know nothing, or he would not seek out our society as he does. Oh, the wickedness of man is very great, said Villefort, since it surpasses the goodness of God. Did you observe that man's eyes while he was speaking to us? No, but have you ever watched him carefully? Doubtless he is capricious, but that is all. One thing alone struck me of all the exquisite things he placed before us. He touched nothing. I might have suspected he was poisoning us. And you see, you would have been deceived. Yes, doubtless. But believe me, that man has other projects. For that reason, I wish to see you, to speak to you, to warn you against everyone, but especially against him. Tell me, cried Villefort, fixing his eyes more steadfastly on her than he had ever done before. Did you ever reveal to anyone our connection? Never to anyone. You understand me, replied Villefort affectionately. 
when I say anyone, pardon my urgency, to anyone living, I mean. Yes, yes, I understand very well, ejaculated the baroness. Never, I swear to you. Were you ever in the habit of writing in the evening what had transpired in the morning? Do you keep a journal? No, my life has been passed in frivolity. I wish to forget it myself. Do you talk in your sleep? I sleep soundly, like a child. Do you not remember? The color mounted to the baroness's face, and Villefort turned awfully pale. It is true, said he, in so low a tone that he could hardly be heard. Well, said the baroness. Well, I understand what I now have to do, replied Villefort. In less than one week from this time, I will ascertain who this Monsieur de Monte Cristo is, whence he comes, where he goes, and why he speaks in our presence of children that have been disinterred in a garden. Villefort pronounced these words with an accent, which would have made the Count shudder had he heard him. Then he pressed the hand the Baroness reluctantly gave him, and led her respectfully back to the door. Madame Danglars returned in another cab to the passage, on the other side of which she found her carriage and her coachman sleeping peacefully on the box while waiting for her. End of chapter 67「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 68 A Summer Ball The same day, during the interview between Madame Danglars and the procurer, a travelling carriage entered the Rue de Helder, passed through the gateway of number 27, and stopped in the yard. In a moment the door was opened, and Madame de Morcerf alighted, leaning on her son's arm. Albert soon left her, ordered his horses, and having arranged his toilette, drove to the Champs-Élysées, to the house of Monte Cristo. The Count received him with his habitual smile. It was a strange thing that no one ever appeared to advance a step in that man's favor. Those who would, as it were, force a passage to his heart, found an impassable barrier. Morcerf, who ran towards him with open arms, was chilled as he drew near, in spite of the friendly smile, and simply held out his hand. Monte Cristo shook it coldly, according to his invariable practice. "'Here I am, dear Count. Welcome home again. I arrived an hour since. From Dieppe? No, from Trepour. Indeed. And I have come at once to see you. That is extremely kind of you, said Monte Cristo, with a tone of perfect indifference. And what is the news? You should not ask a stranger, a foreigner, for news. I know it, but in asking for news, I mean, have you done anything for me? Had you commissioned me? said Monte Cristo, feigning uneasiness. Come, come, said Albert, do not assume so much indifference. It is said, sympathy travels rapidly, and when at Trepour I felt the electric shock, you have either been working for me, or thinking of me. Possibly, said Monte Cristo, I have indeed thought of you, but the magnetic wire I was guiding acted, indeed, without my knowledge. Indeed? Pray tell me how it happened. Willingly. Monsieur Danglars dined with me. I know it. To avoid meeting him, my mother and I left town. But he met here Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Your Italian prince? Not so fast. Monsieur Andrea only calls himself Count. Calls himself, do you say? Yes, calls himself. Is he not a Count? What can I know of him? He calls himself so. I, of course, give him the same title. 
and everyone else does likewise. What a strange man you are! What next? You say Monsieur Danglars dined here? Yes, with Count Cavalcanti, the Marquis, his father, Madame Danglars, Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, charming people, Monsieur de Bray, Maximilien Morel, and Monsieur de Chateau Renaud. Did they speak of me? Not a word. So much the worse. Why so? I thought you wished them to forget you. If they did not speak of me, I am sure they thought about me, and I am in despair. How will that affect you, since Mademoiselle Danglas was not among the number here who thought of you? Truly, she might have thought of you at home. I have no fear of that, or, if she did, it was only in the same way in which I think of her. Touching sympathy. So you hate each other? said the Count. Listen, said Morcerf. If Mademoiselle Danglars were disposed to take pity on my supposed martyrdom on her account, and would dispense with all matrimonial formalities between our two families, I am ready to agree to the arrangement. In a word, Mademoiselle Danglars would make a charming mistress, but a wife? Diable! And this, said Monte Cristo, is your opinion of your intended spouse? Yes. It is rather unkind, I acknowledge, but it is true. But as this dream cannot be realized, since Mademoiselle Danglars must become my lawful wife, live perpetually with me, sing to me, compose verses and music within ten paces of me, and that for my whole life it frightens me. One may forsake a mistress, but a wife? Good heavens! There she must always be, and to marry Mademoiselle Danglars would be awful. You are difficult to please, Viscount. Yes, for I often wish for what is impossible. What is that? To find such a wife as my father found. Monte Cristo turned pale and looked at Albert while playing with some magnificent pistols. Your father was fortunate then, said he. You know my opinion of my mother, Count. Look at her, still beautiful, witty, more charming than ever. For any other son to have stayed with his mother for four days at Trépour, it would have been a condescension, or a martyrdom, while I return more contented, more peaceful, shall I say more poetic, than if I had taken Queen Mab or Titania as my companion. That is an overwhelming demonstration and you would make every one vow to live a single life. Such are my reasons for not liking to marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Have you ever noticed how much a thing is heightened in value when we obtain possession of it? The diamond which glittered in the window at Marles or Fossens shines with more splendor when it is our own. But if we are compelled to acknowledge the superiority of another, and still must retain the one that is inferior, do you not know what we have to endure? Worldling, murmured the Count. Thus I shall rejoice when Mademoiselle Eugenie perceives I am but a pitiful atom, with scarcely as many hundred thousand francs as she has millions. Monte Cristo smiled. One plan occurred to me, continued Albert, Franz likes all that is eccentric. I tried to make him fall in love with Mademoiselle Danglars, but in spite of four letters, written in the most alluring style, he invariably answered, My eccentricity may be great, but it will not make me break my promise. That is what I call devoted friendship, to recommend to another whom you would not marry yourself. Albert smiled. Apropos, continued he, Franz is coming soon, but it will not interest you. You dislike him, I think. I? said Monte Cristo. My dear Viscount, how have you discovered that I did not like Monsieur Franz? I like everyone. And you include me in the expression everyone. Many thanks. Let us not mistake, said Monte Cristo. I love everyone as God commands us to love our neighbor, as Christians. But I thoroughly hate but a few. 
Let us return to Monsieur Franz de Pinay. Did you say he was coming? Yes, summoned by Monsieur de Villefort, who is apparently as anxious to get Mademoiselle Valentine married as Monsieur Danglas is to see Mademoiselle Eugénie settled. It must be a very irksome office to be the father of a grown-up daughter. It seems to make one feverish, and to raise one's pulse to ninety beats a minute until the deed is done. But Monsieur de Pinay, unlike you, bears his misfortune patiently. Still more, he talks seriously about the matter, puts on a white tie, and speaks of his family. He entertains a very high opinion of Monsieur and Madame de Villefort. Which they deserve, do they not? I believe they do. Monsieur de Villefort has always passed for a severe but a just man. There is then one, said Monte Cristo, whom you do not condemn like poor Danglars. Because I am not compelled to marry his daughter, perhaps, replied Albert, laughing. Indeed, my dear sir, said Monte Cristo, you are revoltingly foppish. I, foppish? How do you mean? Yes, pray take a cigar, and cease to defend yourself, and to struggle to escape marrying Mademoiselle Danglars. Let things take their course. Perhaps you may not have to retract. Bah! said Albert, staring. Doubtless, my dear Viscount, you will not be taken by force. And seriously, do you wish to break off your engagement? I would give a hundred thousand francs to be able to do so. Then make yourself quite easy. Monsieur Danglars would give double that sum to attain the same end. Am I indeed so happy? said Albert, who still could not prevent an almost imperceptible cloud passing across his brow. But, my dear Count, has Monsieur Danglars any reason? Ah, there is your proud and selfish nature. You would expose the self love of another with a hatchet but you shrink if your own is attacked with a needle. But yet Monsieur Danglas appeared delighted with you, was he not? Well, he is a man of bad taste, and is still more enchanted with another. I know not whom. Look and judge for yourself. Thank you. I understand. But my mother— No, not my mother. I mistake. My father intends giving a ball— a ball at this season. Summer balls are fashionable. If they were not, the Countess has only to wish it, and they would become so. You are right. You know they are select affairs. Those who remain in Paris in July must be true Parisians. Will you take charge of our invitation to Messieurs Cavalcanti? When will it take place? On Saturday. Monsieur Cavalcanti's father will be gone. But the son will be here. Will you invite young Monsieur Cavalcanti? I do not know him, Viscount. You do not know him? No, I never saw him until a few days since, and am not responsible for him. But you receive him at your house. That is another thing. He was recommended to me by a good abbe, who may be deceived. Give him a direct invitation, but do not ask me to present him. If he were afterwards to marry Mademoiselle Danglas, you would accuse me of intrigue, and would be challenging me. Besides, I may not be there myself. Where? At your ball. Why should you not be there? Because you have not yet invited me. But I come expressly for that purpose. You are very kind, but I may be prevented. If I tell you one thing, you will be so amiable as to set aside all impediments tell me what it is. My mother begs you to come. The Comtesse de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo, starting. Ah, Count, said Albert, I assure you Madame de Morcerf speaks freely to me, and if you have not felt those sympathetic fibres of which I spoke just now thrill within you, you must be entirely devoid of them, for during the last four days we have spoken of no one else. You have talked of me? Yes, that is the penalty of being a living puzzle. Then I am also a puzzle to your mother? I should have thought her too reasonable to be led by imagination. A problem, my dear Count, for everyone. 
for my mother, as well as others. Much studied, but not solved. You still remain an enigma. Do not fear. My mother is only astonished that you remain so long unsolved. I believe, while the Countess G. takes you for Lord Ruthven, my mother imagines you to be Cagliostro, or the Count St. Germain. The first opportunity you have, confirm her in her opinion. It will be easy for you, as you have the philosophy of the one, and the wit of the other. I thank you for the warning, said the Count. I shall endeavour to be prepared for all suppositions. You will, then, come on Saturday? Yes, since Madame de Morcerf invites me. You are very kind. Will Monsieur Danglas be there? He has already been invited by my father. We shall try to persuade the great d'Aguisseau, Monsieur de Villefort, to come, but have not much hope of seeing him. Never despair of anything, says the proverb. Do you dance, Count? I dance? Yes, you. It would not be astonishing. That is very well before one is over forty. No, I do not dance. But I like to see others do so. Does Madame de Morcerf dance? Never. You can talk to her. She so delights in your conversation. Indeed? Yes, truly. And I assure you, you are the only man of whom I have heard her speak with interest. Albert rose and took his hat. The Count conducted him to the door. I have one thing to reproach myself with, said he, stopping Albert on the steps. What is it? I have spoken to you indiscreetly about Danglas. On the contrary, speak to me always in the same strain about him. I am glad to be reassured on that point. Apropos, when do you expect Monsieur de Epinay? Five or six days hence, at the latest. And when is he to be married? Immediately on the arrival of Monsieur and Madame de saint Morin. Bring him to see me. Although you say I do not like him, I assure you I shall be happy to see him. I will obey your orders, my lord. Good-bye. Until Saturday, when I may expect you, may I not? Yes, I promised you. The Count watched Albert, waving his hand to him. When he had mounted his phaeton, Monte Cristo turned, and seeing Bertuccio, What news? said he. She went to the palais, replied the steward. Did she stay long there? An hour and a half. Did she return home? Directly. Well, my dear Bertuccio, said the Count, I now advise you to go in quest of the little estate I spoke to you of in Normandy. Bertuccio bowed, and as his wishes were in perfect harmony with the order he had received, he started the same evening. End of chapter 68「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 69 The Inquiry Monsieur de Villefort kept the promise he had made to Madame Danglars to endeavor to find out how the Count of Monte Cristo had discovered the history of the house at Auteuil. He wrote the same day for the required information to Monsieur de Beauville, who, from having been an inspector of prisons, was promoted to a high office in the police and the latter begged for two days' time to ascertain exactly who would be most likely to give him full particulars. At the end of the second day, M. de Villefort received the following note. The person called the Count of Monte Cristo 
is an intimate acquaintance of Lord Wilmore, a rich foreigner, who is sometimes seen in Paris, and who is there at this moment. He is also known to the Abbe Busoni, a Sicilian priest, of high repute in the East, where he has done much good. Monsieur de Villefort replied by ordering the strictest inquiries to be made respecting these two persons. His orders were executed, and the following evening he received these details. The abbe, who was in Paris only for a month, inhabited a small, two-storied house behind Saint-Sulpice. There were two rooms on each floor, and he was the only tenant. The two lower rooms consisted of a dining-room, with a table, chairs, and sideboard of walnut, and a wainscoted parlour, without ornaments, carpet, or timepiece. It was evident that the abbe limited himself to objects of strict necessity. He preferred to use the sitting-room upstairs, which was more library than parlour, and was furnished with theological books and parchments in which he delighted to bury himself for months at a time, according to his valet de chambre. His valet looked at the visitors through a sort of wicket, and if their faces were unknown to him or displeased him, he replied that the abbé was not in Paris, an answer which satisfied most persons, because the abbé was known to be a great traveller. Besides, whether at home or not, whether in Paris or Cairo, the abbé always left something to give away, which the valet distributed through this wicket in his master's name. The other room near the library was a bedroom, a bed without curtains, four armchairs and a couch, covered with yellow Utrecht velvet, composed with a prie dieu all its furniture. Lord Wilmar resided in Rue Fontaine, Saint-Georges, he was one of those English tourists who consume a large fortune in travelling. He hired the apartment in which he lived furnished, passed only a few hours in the day there, and rarely slept there. One of his peculiarities was never to speak a word of French, which he, however, wrote with great facility. The day after this important information had been given to the king's attorney, a man alighted from a carriage at the corner of the Rue Ferru, and rapping at an olive-green door, asked if the Abbe Busoni were within. No, he went out early this morning, replied the valet. I might not always be content with that answer, replied the visitor, for I come from one to whom everyone must be at home. But have the kindness to give the Abbe Busoni. I told you he was not at home repeated the valet. Then on his return, give him that card and this sealed paper. Will he be home at eight o'clock this evening? Doubtless, unless he is at work, which is the same as if he were out. I will come again at that time, replied the visitor, who then retired. At the appointed hour the same man returned in the same carriage, which, instead of stopping this time, at the end of the Rue Ferru, drove up to the green door. He knocked, and it opened immediately to admit him. From the signs of respect the valet paid him, he saw that his note had produced a good effect. "'Is the abbé at home?' he asked. "'Yes. He is at work in his library. But he expects you, sir,' replied the valet. The stranger ascended a rough staircase, and before a table, illumined by a lamp whose light was concentrated by a large shade, while the rest of the apartment was in partial darkness, he perceived the abbé in a monk's dress, with a cowl on his head, such as was used by learned men of the Middle Ages. "'Have I the honour of addressing the abbé Busoni? asked the visitor. "'Yes, sir,' replied the abbé. "'And you are the person whom Monsieur de Beauville, formerly an inspector of prisons, sends to me from the prefect of police? Exactly, sir. One of the agents appointed to secure the safety of Paris? Yes, sir, replied the stranger, with a slight hesitation and blushing. The abbe replaced the large spectacles, which covered not only his eyes, but his temples, and sitting down motioned to his visitor to do the same. I am at your service, sir, 
said the abbe, with a marked Italian accent. "'The mission with which I am charged, sir,' replied the visitor, speaking with hesitation, "'is a confidential one on the part of him who fulfills it, and him by whom he is employed.' The abbe bowed. "'Your probity,' replied the stranger, "'is so well known to the prefect that he wishes, as a magistrate, to ascertain from you some particulars connected with the public safety, to ascertain which I am deputed to see you. It is hoped that no ties of friendship or humane consideration will induce you to conceal the truth. Provided, sir, the particulars you wish for do not interfere with my scruples or my conscience. I am a priest, sir, and the secrets of confession, for instance, must remain between me and God, and not between me and human justice. Do not alarm yourself, monsieur. We will duly respect your conscience. At this moment the abbe pressed down his side of the shade, and so raised it on the other, throwing a bright light on the stranger's face, while his own remained obscured. Excuse me, abbe, said the envoy of the prefect of the police, but the light tries my eyes very much. The abbe lowered the shade. Now, sir, I am listening. Go on. I will come at once to the point. Do you know the Count of Monte Cristo? You mean Monsieur Zaccone, I presume. Zaccone? Is not his name Monte Cristo? Monte Cristo is the name of an estate, or rather of a rock, and not a family name. Well, be it so, let us not dispute about words. And since Monsieur de Monte Cristo and Monsieur Zaccone are the same, absolutely the same, let us speak of Monsieur Zaccone. Agreed. I asked you if you knew him? Extremely well. Who is he? The son of a rich shipbuilder in Malta. I know that is the report, but as you are aware, the police does not content itself with vague reports. However, replied the abbe, with an affable smile. When that report is in accordance with the truth, everybody must believe it, the police, as well as all the rest. Are you sure of what you assert? What do you mean by that question? Understand, sir, I do not in the least suspect your veracity. I ask if you are certain of it. I knew his father, Monsieur Zaccone. Ah, indeed? and when a child I often played with the son in the timber-yard. But whence does he derive the title of Count? You are aware that may be bought. In Italy? Everywhere. And his immense riches, whence does he procure them? They may not be so very great. How much do you suppose he possesses? From one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand livres per annum. That is reasonable said the visitor. I have heard he had three or four millions. Two hundred thousand per annum would make four millions of capital. But I was told he had four millions per annum. That is not probable. Do you know this island of Monte Cristo? Certainly. Everyone who has come from Palermo, Naples, or Rome to France by sea must know it, since he has passed close to it and must have seen it. I am told it is a delightful place. It is a rock. And why has the Count bought a rock? For the sake of being a Count. In Italy one must have territorial possessions to be a Count. You have doubtless heard the adventures of Monsieur Zaccone's youth. The father's? No, the son's. I know nothing certain. At that period of his life I lost sight of my young comrade. Was he in the wars? I think he entered the service. In what branch? In the navy. Are you not his confessor? No, sir. I believe he is a Lutheran. A Lutheran? I say, I believe such is the case. I do not affirm it. Besides, liberty of conscience is established in France. Doubtless, and we are not now inquiring into his creed, but his actions. In the name of the prefect of police, I ask you what you know of him. He passes for a very charitable man. 
our Holy Father, the Pope, has made him a knight of Jesus Christ for the services he rendered to the Christians in the East. He has five or six rings as testimonials from Eastern monarchs of his services. Does he wear them? No, but he is proud of them. He is better pleased with rewards given to the benefactors of man than to his destroyers. He is a Quaker, then? Exactly. He is a Quaker, with the exception of the peculiar dress. Has he any friends? Yes, everyone who knows him is his friend. But has he any enemies? One only. What is his name? Lord Wilmore. Where is he? He is in Paris just now. Can he give me any particulars? Important ones. He was in India with Sacone. Do you know his abode? It's somewhere in the Chaussee d'Antin, but I know neither the street nor the number. Are you at variance with the Englishman? I love Zucone, and he hates him. We are consequently not friends. Do you think the Count of Monte Cristo had ever been in France before he made this visit to Paris? To that question I can answer positively. No, sir, he had not, because he applied to me six months ago for the particulars he required, and as I did not know when I might again come to Paris, I recommended M. Cavalcanti to him. Andrea? No, Bartolomeo, his father. Now, sir, I have but one question more to ask, and I charge you, in the name of honor, of humanity, and of religion, to answer me candidly. What is it, sir? Do you know with what design M. de Monte Cristo purchased a house at Auteuil? Certainly, for he told me. What is it, sir? To make a lunatic asylum of it, similar to that founded by the Count of Pisani at Palermo. Do you know about that institution? I have heard of it. It is a magnificent charity. Having said this, the abbe bowed to imply he wished to pursue his studies. The visitor either understood the abbe's meaning, or had no more questions to ask. He arose, and the abbe accompanied him to the door. "'You are a great almsgiver,' said the visitor, "'and although you are said to be rich, I will venture to offer you something for your poor people. Will you accept my offering?' "'I thank you, sir. I am only jealous in one thing, and that is that the relief I give should be entirely from my own resources.' However, my resolution, sir, is unchangeable. But you have only to search for yourself, and you will find, alas, but too many objects upon whom to exercise your benevolence. The abbe once more bowed as he opened the door. The stranger bowed and took his leave, and the carriage conveyed him straight to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. An hour afterwards the carriage was again ordered, and this time it went to the Rue Fontaine Saint Georges, and stopped at number five, where Lord Wilmore lived. The stranger had written to Lord Wilmore, requesting an interview, which the latter had fixed for ten o'clock. As the envoy of the prefect of police arrived ten minutes before ten, he was told that Lord Wilmore, who was precision and punctuality personified, was not yet come in, but that he would be sure to return as the clock struck. The visitor was introduced into the drawing-room, which was like all other furnished drawing-rooms, a mantelpiece with two modern Sevres vases, a timepiece representing Cupid with his bent bow, a mirror with an engraving on each side, one representing Homer carrying his guide, the other Belisarius begging, a greyish paper, red and black tapestry, such was the appearance of Lord Wilmore's drawing-room. It was illuminated by lamps with ground-glass shades, which gave only a feeble light, as if out of consideration for the envoy's weak sight. After ten minutes' expectation, the clock struck ten. At the fifth stroke the door opened, and Lord Wilmore appeared. He was rather above the middle height, with thin reddish whiskers, light complexion, and light hair, turning rather grey. He was dressed with all the English peculiarity, 
namely in a blue coat with gilt buttons and high collar, in the fashion of 1811, a white kersimere waistcoat, and nankeen pantaloons three inches too short, but which were prevented by straps from slipping up to the knee. His first remark on entering was, "'You know, sir, I do not speak French.' "'I know you do not like to converse in our language,' replied the envoy. "'But you may use it,' replied Lord Wilmore. "'I understand it.' "'And I,' replied the visitor, changing his idiom, "'know enough of English to keep up the conversation. "'Do not put yourself to the slightest inconvenience.' "'Ah,' said Lord Wilmore, with that tone which is only known to natives of Great Britain. The envoy presented his letter of introduction, which the latter read with English coolness, and having finished, "'I understand,' said he, "'perfectly. Then began the questions, which were similar to those which had been addressed to the Abbe Bussoni, but as Lord Wilmore, in the character of the Count's enemy, was less restrained in his answers, they were more numerous. He described the youth of Monte Cristo, who, he said, at ten years of age, entered the service of one of the petty sovereigns of India, who make war on the English. It was there Wilmore had first met him, and fought against him, and in that war Zucone had been taken prisoner, sent to England, and consigned to the hulks, whence he had escaped by swimming. Then began his travels, his duels, his caprices. Then the insurrection in Greece broke out, and he had served in the Grecian ranks. While in that service he had discovered a silver mine in the mountains of Thessaly, but he had been careful to conceal it from every one. After the battle of Navarino, when the Greek government was consolidated, he asked of King Otho a mining grant for that district which was given him. Hence that immense fortune, which, in Lord Wilmore's opinion, possibly amounted to one or two millions per annum, a precarious fortune, which might be momentarily lost by the failure of the mine. But, asked the visitor, do you know why he came to France? He is speculating in railways, said Lord Wilmore, and as he is an expert chemist and physicist, he has invented a new system of telegraphy, which he is seeking to bring to perfection. "'How much does he spend yearly?' asked the prefect. "'Not more than five or six hundred thousand francs,' said Lord Wilmore. "'He is a miser.' Hatred evidently inspired the Englishman, who, knowing no other reproach to bring on the Count, accused him of avarice. "'Do you know his house at Auteuil?' "'Certainly.' "'What do you know respecting it? "'Do you wish to know why he bought it? "'Yes. "'The Count is a speculator, "'who will certainly ruin himself in experiments. "'He supposes there is in the neighbourhood of the house he has bought "'a mineral spring equal to those at Bagneres, Lucon, and Cotteret. "'He is going to turn his house into a bald house, "'as the Germans term it. He has already dug up all the garden two or three times to find the famous spring, and, being unsuccessful, he will soon purchase all the contiguous houses. Now, as I dislike him, and hope his railway, his electric telegraph, or his search for baths will ruin him, I am watching for his discomfiture, which must soon take place. What was the cause of your quarrel? When he was in England, he seduced the wife of one of my friends. Why do you not seek revenge? I have already fought three duels with him, said the Englishman, the first with the pistol, the second with the sword, and the third with the sabre. And what was the result of those duels? The first time he broke my arm, the second he wounded me in the breast, and the third time made this large wound. The Englishman turned down his shirt-collar and showed a scar, whose redness proved to be a recent one. "'So that, you see, there is a deadly feud between us.' "'But,' said the envoy, "'you do not go about it in the right way to kill him, if I understand you correctly.' "'Ah?' said the Englishman. "'I practice shooting every day, and every other day Greasier comes to my house.' 
This was all the visitor wished to ascertain, or rather all the Englishmen appeared to know. The agent arose, and having bowed to Lord Wilmore, who returned his salutation with the stiff politeness of the English, he retired. Lord Wilmore, having heard the door close after him, returned to his bedroom, where with one hand he pulled off his light hair, his red whiskers, his false jaw, and his wound, to resume the black hair, dark complexion, and pearly teeth of the Count of Monte Cristo. It was Monsieur de Villefort, and not the prefect, who returned to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. The procurer felt more at ease, although he had learned nothing really satisfactory, and, for the first time since the dinner party at O'Toole, he slept soundly. End of chapter 69This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 70 the ball. It was in the warmest days of July when in due course of time the Saturday arrived upon which the ball was to take place at Monsieur de Morcerf's. It was ten o'clock at night. The branches of the great trees in the garden of the Count's house stood out boldly against the azure canopy of heaven, which was studded with golden stars, but where the last fleeting clouds of a vanishing storm yet lingered. From the apartments on the ground floor might be heard the sound of music, with the whirl of the waltz and gallop, while brilliant streams of light shone through the openings of the Venetian blinds. At this moment the garden was only occupied by about ten servants, who had just received orders from their mistress to prepare the supper, the serenity of the weather continuing to increase. Until now, it had been undecided whether the supper should take place in the dining-room or under a long tent erected on the lawn, but the beautiful blue sky, studded with stars, had settled the question in favour of the lawn. The gardens were illuminated with coloured lanterns, according to the Italian custom, and as is usual in countries where the luxuries of the table, the rarest of all luxuries in their complete form, are well understood, the supper-table was loaded with wax lights and flowers. At the time the Countess of Morcerf returned to the rooms, after giving her orders, many guests were arriving, more attracted by the charming hospitality of the Countess than by the distinguished position of the Count. For, owing to the good taste of Mercedes, one was sure of finding some devices at her entertainment worthy of describing or even copying, in case of need. Madame Danglars, in whom the events we have related had caused deep anxiety, had hesitated about going to Madame de Morcerf's, when during the morning her carriage happened to meet that of Villefort. The latter made a sign, and when the carriages had drawn close together, said, "'You are going to Madame de Morcerf's, are you not?' "'No,' replied Madame Danglars. "'I am too ill.' "'You are wrong,' replied Villefort significantly. "'It is important that you should be seen there.' "'Do you think so?' asked the baroness. "'I do. "'In that case I will go.' And the two carriages passed on towards their different destinations. Madame Danglars therefore came, not only beautiful in person, but radiant with splendour. She entered by one door, at the time when Mercedes appeared at the door." The Countess took Albert to meet Madame Danglars. He approached, paid her some well-merited compliments on her toilette, and offered his arm to conduct her to a seat. Albert looked around him. "'You are looking for my daughter,' said the Baroness, smiling. 
I confess it,' replied Albert. "'Could you have been so cruel as not to bring her?' "'Calm yourself. She has met Mademoiselle de Villefort, and has taken her arm. See, they are following us, both in white dresses, one with a bouquet of camellias, the other with one of my osotis. But tell me, well, what do you wish to know? Will not the Count of Monte Cristo be here tonight? Seventeen, replied Albert. What do you mean? I only mean that the Count seems the rage, replied the Viscount, smiling, and that you are the seventeenth person that has asked me the same question. The Count is in fashion. I congratulate him upon it. "'And have you replied to every one as you have to me?' "'Ah, to be sure. I have not answered you. "'Be satisfied. We shall have this lion. We are among the privileged ones.' "'Were you at the opera yesterday?' "'No. He was there.' "'Ah, indeed. And did the eccentric person commit any new originality?' "'Can he be seen without doing so? Elsler was dancing the Diable Boiteau. The Greek princess was in ecstasies. After the cachucha, he placed a magnificent ring on the stem of a bouquet, and threw it to the charming danseuse, who, in the third act, to do honor to the gift, reappeared with it on her finger. And the Greek princess, will she be here? No, you will be deprived of that pleasure. Her position in the Count's establishment is not sufficiently understood. Wait, leave me here. "'and go and speak to Madame de Villefort, "'who is trying to attract your attention.' "'Albert bowed to Madame d'Anglas "'and advanced towards Madame de Villefort, "'whose lips opened as he approached. "'I wager anything,' said Albert, interrupting her, "'that I know what you are about to say. "'Well, what is it? "'If I guess rightly, will you confess it? "'Yes. "'On your honour? "'On my honour. You were going to ask me if the Count of Monte Cristo had arrived, or was expected. Not at all. It is not of him that I am now thinking. I was going to ask you if you had received any news of Monsieur Franz. Yes, yesterday. What did he tell you? That he was leaving at the same time as his letter. Well, now then. The Count? The Count will come. Of that you may be satisfied. You know that he has another name besides Monte Cristo? "'No, I did not know it. "'Monte Cristo is the name of an island, "'and he has a family name. "'I never heard it. "'Well, then, I am better informed than you. "'His name is Zaccone. "'It is possible. "'He is a Maltese. "'That is also possible. "'The son of a ship-owner. "'Really, you should relate all this aloud. "'You would have the greatest success. "'He served in India, "'discovered a mine in Thessaly, and comes to Paris to establish a mineral water cure at Auteuil. "'Well, I'm sure,' said Morcerf, "'this is indeed news. Am I allowed to repeat it?' "'Yes, but cautiously. Tell one thing at a time, and do not say I told you.' "'Why so? Because it is a secret just discovered. By whom? The police. Then the news originated. At the prefect's last night, Paris, you can understand, is astonished at the sight of such unusual splendor, and the police have made inquiries. Well, well, nothing more is wanting than to arrest the Count as a vagabond, on the pretext of his being too rich. Indeed, that doubtless would have happened if his credentials had not been so favorable. Poor Count! And is he aware of the danger he has been in? I think not. "'Then it will be but charitable to inform him. "'When he arrives I will not fail to do so.' "'Just then a handsome young man, "'with bright eyes, black hair, and glossy moustache, "'respectfully bowed to Madame de Villefort. "'Albert extended his hand. "'Madame,' said Albert, "'allow me to present to you Monsieur Maximilien Morel, "'captain of Spahis, one of our best.' and above all of our bravest officers. I have already had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman at Auteuil, at the house of the Count of Monte Cristo, replied Madame de Villefort, turning away with marked coldness of manner. This answer, and especially the tone in which it was uttered, chilled the heart of poor Morel. But a recompense was in store for him. 
Turning around, he saw near the door a beautiful, fair face, whose large blue eyes were, without any marked expression, fixed upon him, while the bouquet of myosotis was gently raised to her lips. The salutation was so well understood that Morel, with the same expression in his eyes, placed the handkerchief to his mouth, and these two living statues, whose hearts beat so violently under their marble aspect, separated from each other by the whole length of the room, forgot themselves for a moment, or rather forgot the world in their mutual contemplation. They might have remained much longer lost in one another without any one noticing their abstraction. The Count of Monte Cristo had just entered. We have already said that there was something in the Count which attracted universal attention wherever he appeared. It was not the coat, unexceptional in its cut, though simple and unornamented. It was not the plain white waistcoat. It was not the trousers that displayed the foot so perfectly formed. It was none of these things that attracted the attention. It was his pale complexion, his waving black hair, his calm and serene expression, his dark and melancholy eye, his mouth, chiseled with such marvellous delicacy, which so easily expressed such high disdain, these were what fixed the attention of all upon him. Many men might have been handsomer, but certainly there could be none whose appearance was more significant, if the expression may be used. Everything about the Count seemed to have its meaning, for the constant habit of thought which he had acquired had given an ease and vigor to the expression of his face, and even to the most trifling gesture scarcely to be understood. Yet the Parisian world is so strange, that even all this might not have won attention, had there not been connected with it a mysterious story, gilded by an immense fortune. Meanwhile he advanced through the assemblage of guests, under a battery of curious glances, towards Madame de Morcerf, who, standing before a mantelpiece ornamented with flowers, had seen his entrance in a looking-glass placed opposite the door, and was prepared to receive him. She turned towards him with a serene smile just at the moment he was bowing to her. No doubt she fancied the Count would speak to her, while on his side the Count thought she was about to address him, but both remained silent, and after a mere bow, Monte Cristo directed his steps to Albert, who received him cordially. "'Have you seen my mother?' asked Albert. "'I have just had the pleasure,' replied the Count, "'but I have not seen your father. "'See, he is down there, talking politics with that little group of great geniuses.' "'Indeed,' said Monte Cristo. "'And so those gentlemen down there are men of great talent? "'I should not have guessed it. "'And for what kind of talent are they celebrated? "'You know there are different sorts. "'That tall, harsh-looking man is very learned. "'He discovered in the neighborhood of Rome "'a kind of lizard with a vertebra, "'more than lizards usually have, "'and he immediately laid his discovery before the Institute. "'The thing was discussed for a long time, "'but finally decided in his favor. "'I can assure you that the vertebra "'made a great noise in the learned world.' and the gentleman, who was only a knight of the Legion of Honor, was made an officer. Come, said Monte Cristo, this cross seems to me to be wisely awarded. I suppose, had he found another additional vertebra, they would have made him a commander? Very likely, said Aubert. And who can that person be, who has taken it into his head to wrap himself up in a blue coat embroidered with green? Oh, that coat is not his own idea. It is the Republic's which deputed David to devise a uniform for the academicians. Indeed, said Monte Cristo, so this gentle is an academician? Within the last week he has been made one of the learned assembly. And what is his especial talent? His talent? I believe he thrusts pins through the head of rabbits. He makes fowls eat matter and punches the spinal marrow out of dogs with whalebone. And he is made a member of the Academy of Sciences for this. No, of the French Academy. But what has the French Academy to do with all this? 
I was going to tell you. It seems that his experiments have very considerably advanced the cause of science, doubtless. No, that his style of writing is very good. This must be very flattering to the feelings of the rabbits, into whose heads he has thrust pins, to the fowls whose bones he has dyed red, and to the dogs whose spinal marrow he has punched out. Albert laughed. And the other one? demanded the Count. That one? Yes, the third. The one in the dark blue coat? Yes. He is a colleague of the Count, and one of the most active opponents to the idea of providing the Chamber of Peers with a uniform. He was very successful upon that question. He stood badly with the liberal papers, but his noble opposition to the wishes of the court is now getting him into favor with the journalists. They talk of making him an ambassador. And what are his claims to the peerage? He has composed two or three comic operas, written four or five articles in the sequel, and voted five or six years on the ministerial side. Bravo, Viscount, said Monte Cristo, smiling. You are a delightful Sicarone. And now you will do me a favor, will you not? What is it? Do not introduce me to any of these gentlemen, and should they wish it, you will warn me. Just then the Count felt his arm pressed. He turned round. It was Danglars. Ah, is it you, Baron? said he. Why do you call me Baron? said Danglars. You know that I care nothing for my title. I am not like you, Viscount. You like your title, do you not? Certainly, replied Albert, seeing that without my title I should be nothing, while you, sacrificing the Baron, would still remain the millionaire. Which seems to me the finest title under the royalty of July, replied Danglars. Unfortunately, said Monte Cristo, one's title to a millionaire does not last for life. Like that of Baron, peer of France, or Academician, for example, the millionaires Franck and Pullman, of Frankfurt, who have just become bankrupts. Indeed? said Danglars, becoming pale. Yes, I received the news this evening by courier. I had a million in their hands, but, warned in time, I withdrew it a month ago. Ah, mon Dieu! exclaimed Danglars. They have drawn on me for two hundred thousand francs. Well, you can throw out the draft. Their signature is worth five per cent. Yes, but it is too late, said Danglars. I have honored their bills. Then, said Monte Cristo, here are two hundred thousand francs gone after. Hush! Do not mention these things, said Danglars. Then, approaching Monte Cristo, he added, especially before young Monsieur Cavalcanti, after which he smiled and turned towards the young man in question. Albert had left the Count to speak to his mother. Danglars to converse with young Cavalcanti. Monte Cristo was for an instant alone. Meanwhile, the heat became excessive. Footmen were hastening through the rooms with waiters loaded with ices. Monte Cristo wiped the perspiration from his forehead, but drew back when the waiter was presented to him. He took no refreshment. Madame de Morcerf did not lose sight of Monte Cristo. She saw that he took nothing and even noticed his gesture of refusal. Albert, she asked, did you notice that? What, mother? That the Count has never been willing to partake of food under the roof of Monsieur de Morcerf. Yes, but then he breakfasted with me. Indeed, he made his first appearance in the world on that occasion. But your house is not Monsieur de Morcerf's, murmured Mercedes, and since he has been here, I have watched him. Well, well, he has taken nothing yet. The Count is very temperate. Mercedes smiled sadly. Approach him, said she, and when the next waiter passes, insist upon his taking something. But why, mother? Just to please me, Albert, said Mercedes. Albert kissed his mother's hand and drew near the Count. Another salver passed, loaded like the preceding ones. She saw Albert attempt to persuade the Count but he obstinately refused. Albert rejoined his mother. She was very pale. Well, said she, you see he refuses. Yes, but why need this annoy you? You know, Albert, women are singular creatures. 
I should like to have seen the Count take something in my house, if only an ice. Perhaps he cannot reconcile himself to the French style of living, and might prefer something else. Oh, no! I have seen him eat of everything in Italy. No doubt he does not feel inclined this evening. And besides, said the Countess, accustomed as he is to burning climates, possibly he does not feel the heat as we do. I do not think that, for he has complained of feeling almost suffocated, and asked why the Venetian blinds were not opened, as well as the windows. In a word, said Mercedes, it was a way of assuring me that his abstinence was intended. And she left the room. A minute afterwards the blinds were thrown open, and through the jessamine and clematis that overhung the window, one could see the garden ornamented with lanterns, and the supper laid under the tent. Dancers, players, talkers, all uttered an exclamation of joy. Every one inhaled with delight the breeze that floated in. At the same time, Mercedes reappeared, paler than before, but with that imperturbable expression of countenance which she sometimes wore. She went straight to the group of which her husband formed the centre. Do not detain those gentlemen here, Count, she said. They would prefer, I should think, to breathe in the garden rather than suffocate here, since they are not playing. Ah, said a gallant old general, who in 1809 had sung Partant pour la Syrie, we will not go alone to the garden. Then, said Mercedes, I will lead the way. Turning towards Monte Cristo, she added, Count, will you oblige me with your arm? The Count almost staggered at these simple words. Then he fixed his eyes on Mercedes. It was only a momentary glance, but it seemed to the Countess to have lasted for a century. So much was expressed in that one look. He offered his arm to the Countess. She took it, or rather just touched it with her little hand, and they together descended the steps, lined with rhododendrons and camellias. Behind them, by another outlet, a group of about twenty persons rushed into the garden with loud exclamations of delight. End of chapter 70「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris the Girl. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 71 Bread and Salt. Madame de Marcelf entered an archway of trees with her companion. It led through a grove of lindens to a conservatory. It was too warm in the room, was it not, Count? she asked. Yes, madame and it was an excellent idea of yours to open the doors and the blinds. As he ceased speaking, the Count felt the hand of Mercedes tremble. But you, he said, with that light dress and without anything to cover you but that gauze scarf, perhaps you feel cold? Do you know where I'm leading you? said the Countess, without replying to the question. No, madame, replied Monte Cristo. but you see, I make no resistance. We are going to the greenhouse that you see at the other end of the grove. The Count looked at Mercedes, as if to interrogate her, but she continued to walk on in silence, and he refrained from speaking. They reached the building, ornamented with magnificent fruits, which ripen at the beginning of July in the artificial temperature which takes the place of the sun, so frequently absent in our climate. The Countess left the arm of Monte Cristo and gathered a bunch of muscatel grapes. See, Count, she said, with a smile so sad in its expression that one could almost detect the tears on her eyelids. See, our French grapes are not to be compared, I know, with yours of Sicily and Cyprus. But you will make allowance for our northern sun. The Count bowed, but stepped back. Do you refuse? said Mercedes in a tremulous voice. Pray excuse me, madame, replied Monte Cristo, but I never eat muscatel grapes. Mercedes let them fall and sighed. A magnificent peach was hanging against an adjoining wall, ripened by the same artificial heat. Mercedes drew near and plucked the fruit. Take this peach, then, she said. 
The Count again refused. "'What, again?' she exclaimed, in so plaintive an accent that it seemed to stifle a sob. "'Really, you pain me.' A long silence followed. The peach, like the grapes, fell to the ground. "'Count,' added Mercedes, with a supplicating glance, "'there is a beautiful Arabian custom which makes eternal friends of those who have together eaten bread and salt under the same roof.' "'I know it, madame.' replied the Count. But we are in France, and not in Arabia, and in France eternal friendships are as rare as the custom of dividing bread and salt with one another. But, said the Countess, breathlessly, with her eyes fixed on Monte Cristo, whose arm she convulsively pressed with both hands, we are friends, are we not? The Count became pale as death, the blood rushed to his heart, and then again, rising, dyed his cheeks with crimson. His eyes swam like those of a man suddenly dazzled. "'Certainly we are friends,' he replied. "'Why should we not be?' The answer was so little like the one Mercedes desired that she turned away to give vent to a sigh, which sounded more like a groan. "'Thank you,' she said. And they walked on again. They went the whole length of the garden without uttering a word. "'Sir!' suddenly exclaimed the countess, after their walk had continued ten minutes in silence. Is it true that you have seen so much, travelled so far, and suffered so deeply? I have suffered deeply, madame, answered Monte Cristo. But now you are happy? Doubtless, replied the count, since no one hears me complain. And your present happiness, has it softened your heart? My present happiness equals my past misery, said the count. "'Are you not married?' asked the Countess. "'I? Married?' exclaimed Monte Cristo, shuddering. "'Who could have told you so?' "'No one told me you were. "'But you have frequently been seen at the opera with a young and lovely woman.' "'She is a slave, whom I bought at Constantinople, madame, the daughter of a prince. "'I have adopted her as my daughter, having no one else to love in the world.' "'You live alone, then?' "'I do.' "'You have no sister?' No son? No father? I have no one. How can you exist thus without any one to attach you to life? It is not my fault, madame. At Malta I loved a young girl, who was on the point of marrying her, when war came and carried me away. I thought she loved me well enough to wait for me, and even to remain faithful to my memory. When I returned, she was married. This is the history of most men who have passed twenty years of age. Perhaps my heart was weaker than the hearts of most men, and I suffered more than they would have done in my place. That is all. The Countess stopped for a moment, as if gasping for breath. Yes, she said, and you have still preserved this love in your heart. One can only love once. And did you ever see her again? Never. Never? I never returned to the country where she lived. To Malta? Yes, Malta. She is, then, now at Malta? I think so. And have you forgiven her for all she has made you suffer? Her, yes. But only her. Do you then still hate those who separated you? I hate them? Not at all. Why should I? The Countess placed herself before Monte Cristo, still holding in her hand a portion of the perfumed grapes. Take some, she said. Madame, I never eat muscatel grapes, replied Monte Cristo as if the subject had not been mentioned before. The Countess dashed the grapes into the nearest thicket, with a gesture of despair. Inflexible man, she murmured. Monte Cristo remained as unmoved as if the reproach had not been addressed to him. Albert at this moment ran in. Oh, mother, he exclaimed, such a misfortune has happened. What, what has happened? asked the Countess, as though awakening from a sleep to the realities of life. Did you say a misfortune? Indeed. I should expect misfortunes. Monsieur de Villefort is here. Well? He comes to fetch his wife and daughter. Why so? Because Madame de saint Mahon is just arrived in Paris, bringing the news of Monsieur de saint Mahon's death, which took place on the first stage after he left Marseille. Madame de Villefort, who is in very good spirits, would neither believe nor think of the misfortune. But Mademoiselle Valentine, at the first words, guessed the whole truth, notwithstanding all the precautions of her father. The blow struck her like a thunderbolt, and she fell senseless. 
"'And how is Monsieur de saint Mauran related to Mademoiselle de Villefort?' said the Count. "'He was her grandfather on the mother's side. He was coming here to hasten her marriage with Franz.' "'Ah, indeed. So Franz must wait. Why was not Monsieur de saint Mauran also grandfather to Mademoiselle Danglars?' "'Albert, Albert,' said Madame de Morcerf, in a tone of mild reproof, "'what are you saying?' "'Ah, Count, he esteems you so highly. Tell him that he has spoken amiss.' And she took two or three steps forward. Monte Cristo watched her with an air so thoughtful and so full of affectionate admiration that she turned back and grasped his hand. At the same time, she seized that of her son and joined them together. "'We are friends, are we not?' she asked. "'Oh, madame, I do not presume to call myself your friend, but at all times I am your most respectful servant.' The countess left with an indescribable pang in her heart, and before she had taken ten steps, the count saw her raise her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Do not my mother and you agree?' asked Albert, astonished. "'On the contrary,' replied the count. "'Did you not hear her declare that we were friends?' They re-entered the drawing-room which Valentine and Madame de Villefort had just quitted. It is perhaps needless to add that Morel departed almost at the same time. End of chapter 71 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Joe Burbage from London, UK, in October 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 72 Madame de Saint Marin. A gloomy scene had indeed just passed at the house of Monsieur de Villefort. After the ladies had departed for the ball, whither all the entreaties of Madame de Villefort had failed in persuading him to accompany them, the procureur had shut himself up in his study, according to his custom, with a heap of papers calculated to alarm anyone else, but which generally scarcely satisfied his inordinate desires. But this time the papers were a mere matter of form. Villefort had secluded himself, not to study, but to reflect, and with the door locked and orders given that he should not be disturbed excepting for important business. He sat down in his armchair and began to ponder over the events, the remembrance of which had, during the last eight days, filled his mind with so many gloomy thoughts and bitter recollections. Then, instead of plunging into the mass of documents piled before him, he opened the drawer of his desk, touched the spring, and drew out a parcel of cherished memoranda, amongst which he had carefully arranged, in characters only known to himself, the names of all those who, either in his political career, in money matters, at the bar, or in his mysterious love affairs, had become his enemies. Their number was formidable, now that he had begun to fear, and yet these names, powerful though they were, had often caused him to smile with the same kind of satisfaction experienced by a traveller who, from the summit of a mountain, beholds at his feet the craggy eminences, the almost impassable paths, and the fearful chasms, through which he has so perilously climbed. When he had run over all these names in his memory, again read and studied them, commenting meanwhile upon his lists, he shook his head. No, he murmured, none of my enemies would have waited so patiently and laboriously for so long a space of time that they might now come and crush me with this secret. Sometimes, as Hamlet says, Foul deeds will rise, Though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. But, like a phosphoric light, They rise but to mislead. The story has been told by the Corsican to some priest, Who, in his turn, has repeated it. Monsieur de Monte Cristo may have heard it, And, to enlighten himself, but why should he wish to enlighten himself upon the subject? asked Villefort, after a moment's reflection. What interest can this Monsieur de Monte Cristo, or Monsieur Zaccone, son of a shipowner of Malta, discoverer of a mine in Thessaly, now visiting Paris for the first time, 
What interest, I say, can he take in discovering a gloomy, mysterious, and useless fact like this? However, among all the incoherent details given to me by the Ab Bussini and by Lord Wilmore, by that friend and that enemy, one thing appears certain and clear in my opinion, that in no period, in no case, in no circumstance, could there have been any contact between him and me. But Villefort uttered words which even he himself did not believe. He dreaded not so much the revelation, for he could reply to or deny its truth. He cared little for that mene, tekel, ufarsin, which appeared suddenly in letters of blood upon the wall. But what he was really anxious for was to discover whose hand had traced them. While he was endeavouring to calm his fears, and instead of dwelling upon the political future that had so often been the subject of his ambitious dreams, was imagining a future limited to the enjoyments of home, in fear of awakening the enemy that had so long slept. The noise of a carriage sounded in the yard. Then he heard the steps of an aged person ascending the stairs, followed by tears and lamentations, such as servants always give vent to when they wish to appear interested in their master's grief. He drew back the bolt of his door, and almost directly an old lady entered, unannounced, carrying her shawl on her arm and her bonnet in her hand. The white hair was thrown back from her yellow forehead, and her eyes, already sunken by the furrows of age, now almost disappeared beneath the eyelids, swollen with grief. "'Oh, sir,' she said, "'oh, sir, what a misfortune! I shall die of it! Oh, yes, I shall certainly die of it!' And then, falling upon the chair nearest the door, she burst into a paroxysm of sobs. The servants, standing in the doorway, not daring to approach nearer, were looking at Noirtier's old servant, who had heard the noise from his master's room, and run there also, remaining behind the others. Villefort rose, and ran towards his mother-in-law, for it was she. "'Why, what can have happened?' he exclaimed. "'What has thus disturbed you? Is Monsieur de saint with you?' Monsieur de saint is dead, answered the old marchioness. Without preface and without expression, she appeared to be stupefied. Villefort drew back, and clasping his hands together, exclaimed, Dead? So suddenly? A week ago, continued Madame de saint we went out together in the carriage after dinner. Monsieur de saint had been unwell for some days. Still, the idea of seeing our dear Valentine again inspired him with courage, and notwithstanding his illness, he would leave. At six leagues from Marseilles, after having eaten some of the lozenges he is accustomed to take, he fell into such a deep sleep that it appeared to me unnatural. Still, I hesitated to wake him, although I fancied that his face was flushed and that the veins of his temples throbbed more violently than usual. However, as it became dark, and I could no longer see, I fell asleep. I was soon aroused by a piercing shriek, as from a person suffering in his dreams, and he suddenly threw his head back violently. I called the valet, I stopped the postillion, I spoke to Monsieur de saint I applied my smelling salts, but all was over, and I arrived at X by the side of a corpse. Villefort stood with his mouth, half open, quite stupefied. Of course, you sent for a doctor. Immediately, but, as I have told you, it was too late. Yes, but then he could tell of what complaint the poor Marquise had died. Oh yes, sir, he told me. It appears to have been an apoplectic stroke. And what did you do then? Monsieur de saint Marin had always expressed a desire, in case his death happened during his absence from Paris, that his body might be brought to the family vault. I had him put into a lead coffin, and I am preceding him by a few days. Oh, my poor mother, said Villefort, to have such duties to perform at your age, after such a blow. 
God has supported me through all. And then, my dear Marquis, he would certainly have done everything for me that I performed for him. It is true that since I left him, I seem to have lost my senses. I cannot cry. At my age, they say that we have no more tears. Still, I think that when one is in trouble, one should have the power of weeping. Where is Valentine, sir? It is on her account I am here. I wish to see Valentine. Villefort thought it would be terrible to reply that Valentine was at a ball, so he only said that she had gone out with her stepmother, and that she should be fetched. This instant, sir, this instant, I beseech you, said the old lady. Villefort placed the arm of Madame de saint Marin within his own, and conducted her to his apartment. Rest yourself, mother, he said. The Marchioness raised her head at this word, and beholding the man who so forcibly reminded her of her deeply regretted child, who still lived for her in Valentine, she felt touched at the name of her mother, and, bursting into tears, she fell on her knees before an armchair, where she buried her venerable head. Villefort left her to the care of the women, while old Barrois ran, half scared, to his master. For nothing frightens old people so much as when death relaxes its vigilance over them for a moment in order to strike some other old person. Then, while Madame de saint Marin remained on her knees, praying fervently, Villefort sent for a cab, and went himself to fetch his wife and daughter from Madame de Morcef's. He was so pale when he appeared at the door of the ballroom, that Valentine ran to him, saying, Oh, father, some misfortune has happened. Your grandmamma has just arrived, Valentine, said Monsieur de Villefort. And grandpapa, inquired the young girl, trembling with apprehension. Monsieur de Villefort only replied by offering his arm to his daughter. It was just in time, for Valentine's head swam, and she staggered. Madame de Villefort instantly hastened to her assistance, and aided her husband in dragging her to the carriage, saying, What a singular event! Who could have thought it? Ah, yes, it is indeed strange. And the wretched family departed, leaving a cloud of sadness hanging over the rest of the evening. At the foot of the stairs, Valentine found Barrois awaiting her. Monsieur Noirtier wishes to see you tonight, he said, in an undertone. Tell him I will come when I leave my dear grandmamma, she replied, feeling, with true delicacy, that the person to whom she could be of the most service just then was Madame de saint Marin. Valentine found her grandmother in bed, silent caresses, heart-wrung sobs, broken sighs, burning tears, were all that passed in this sad interview, while Madame de Villefort, leaning on her husband's arm, maintained all outward forms of respect, at least towards the poor widow. She soon whispered to her husband, I think it would be better for me to retire, with your permission, for the sight of me appears still to afflict your mother-in-law. Madame de saint Marin heard her. Yes, yes, she said softly to Valentine. Let her leave. But do you stay? Madame de Villefort left, and Valentine remained alone beside the bed, for the procureur, overcome with astonishment at the unexpected death, had followed his wife. Meanwhile, Barrois had returned for the first time to old Noirtier, who, having heard the noise in the house, had, as we have said, sent his old servant to inquire the cause. On his return, his quick, intelligent eye interrogated the messenger. Alas, sir, exclaimed Barrois, a great misfortune has happened. Madame de saint Marin has arrived, and her husband is dead. Madame de saint Marin and Noirtier had never been on strict terms of friendship. Still, the death of one old man always considerably affects another. Noirtier let his head fall upon his chest, apparently overwhelmed and thoughtful. Then he closed one eye, in token of inquiry. Mademoiselle Valentine, Noirtier nodded his head. She is at the ball, as you know, since she came to say goodbye to you in full dress. Noirtier again closed his left eye. 
Do you wish to see her? Noitier again made an affirmative sign. Well, they have gone to fetch her, no doubt, from Madame de Morcerf's. I will await her return, and beg her to come up here. Is that what you wish for? Yes, replied the invalid. Barois, therefore, as we have seen, watched for Valentine, and informed her of her grandfather's wish. Consequently, Valentine came up to Noirtier, on leaving Madame de saint Marin, who, in the midst of her grief, had at last yielded to fatigue, and fallen into a feverish sleep. Within reach of her hand, they placed a small table, upon which stood a bottle of orangeade, her usual beverage, and a glass. Then, as we have said, the young girl left the bedside to see Monsieur Noirtier. Valentine kissed the old man, who looked at her with such tenderness that her eyes again filled with tears, whose sources he thought must be exhausted. The old gentleman continued to dwell upon her with the same expression. Yes, yes, said Valentine. You mean that I have yet a kind grandfather left, do you not? The old man intimated that such was his meaning. Ah, yes, happily I have, replied Valentine. Without that, what would become of me? It was one o'clock in the morning. Barrois, who wished to go to bed himself, observed that after such sad events every one stood in need of rest. Noirtier would not say that the only rest he needed was to see his child, but wished her good night, for grief and fatigue had made her appear quite ill. The next morning she found her grandmother in bed. The fever had not abated. On the contrary, her eyes glistened, and she appeared to be suffering from violent nervous irritability. "'Oh, dear grandmother, are you worse?' exclaimed Valentine, perceiving all these signs of agitation. "'No, my child, no,' said Madame de saint -Marin. "'But I was impatiently waiting for your arrival, that I might send for your father.' "'My father?' inquired Valentine uneasily. "'Yes, I wish to speak to him.' Valentine durst not oppose her grandmother's wish, the cause of which she did not know, and an instant afterwards Villefort entered. Sir, said Madame de Samara, without using any circumlocution, and as if fearing she had no time to lose, you wrote to me concerning the marriage of this child. Yes, madame, replied Villefort, it is not only projected, but arranged. Your intended son-in-law is named Monsieur Franz d'Epinay? Yes, madame. Is he not the son of General d'Epinay, who was on our side, and who was assassinated some days before the usurper returned from the island of Elba? The same. Does he not dislike the idea of marrying the granddaughter of a Jacobin? Our civil dissensions are now happily extinguished, mother, said Villefort. Monsieur d'Epinay was quite a child when his father died. He knows very little of Monsieur Noirtier, and will meet him, if not with pleasure, at least with indifference. Is it a suitable match? In every respect. And the young man? Is regarded with universal esteem. You approve of him? He is one of the most well-bred young men I know. During the whole of this conversation, Valentine had remained silent. Well, sir, said Madame de saint -Marin, after a few minutes' reflection, I must hasten the marriage, for I have but a short time to live. You, madame? You, dear mamma? exclaimed Monsieur de Villefort and Valentine at the same time. I know what I am saying, continued the Marchioness. I must hurry you, so that, as she has no mother, she may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage. I am all that is left to her belonging to my poor René, whom you have so soon forgotten, sir." "'Ah, madame,' said Villefort, "'you forget that I was obliged to give a mother to my child. A stepmother is never a mother, sir. But this is not to the purpose. Our business concerns Valentine. Let us leave the dead in peace.'" All this was said with such exceeding rapidity that there was something in the conversation that seemed like the beginning of delirium. It shall be as you wish, madame, said Villefort, more especially since your wishes coincide with mine, 
and as soon as Monsieur d'Epinay arrives in Paris... My dear grandmother, interrupted Valentine, consider decorum, the recent death. You would not have me marry under such sad auspices. My child, exclaimed the old lady sharply, let us hear none of the conventional objections that deter weak minds from preparing for the future. I also was married at the deathbed of my mother, and certainly I have not been less happy on that account. Still, that idea of death, madame, said Villefort, still? Always. I tell you, I am going to die. Do you understand? Well, before dying, I wish to see my son-in-law. I wish to tell him to make my child happy. I wish to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me. In fact, I will know him. I will, continued the old lady, with a fearful expression, that I may rise from the depths of my grave to find him, if he should not fulfil his duty. Madame, said Villefort, you must lay aside these exalted ideas, which almost assume the appearance of madness. The dead, once buried in their graves, rise no more. And I tell you, sir, that you aren't mistaken. This night I have had a fearful sleep. It seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body. My eyes, which I tried to open, closed against my will. And what will appear impossible, above all to you, sir, I saw, with my eyes shut, in the spot where you are now standing, issuing from that corner where there is a door leading into Madame Villefort's dressing-room. I saw, I tell you, silently enter, a white figure. Valentine screamed. It was the fever that disturbed you, Madame, said Villefort. Doubt, if you please, but I am sure of what I say. I saw a white figure, and as if to prevent my discrediting the testimony of only one of my senses, I heard my glass removed, the same which is there now on the table. Oh, dear mother, it was a dream. So little was it a dream that I stretched my hand towards the bell, but when I did so, the shade disappeared. My maid then entered with a light. But she saw no one. Phantoms are visible to those only who ought to see them. It was the soul of my husband. Well, if my husband's soul can come to me, why should not my soul reappear to guard my granddaughter? The tie is even more direct, it seems to me. Oh, madame, said Villefort, deeply affected, in spite of himself, do not yield to those gloomy thoughts. You will long live with us, happy, loved, and honoured and we will make you forget. Never, 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 said the Marchioness. When does Mr. Epinay return? We expect him every moment. It is well. As soon as he arrives, inform me. We must be expeditious, and then I also wish to see a notary, that I may be assured that all our property returns to Valentine. Ah, Grandma, murmured Valentine, pressing her lips on the burning brow. Do you wish to kill me? Oh, how feverish you are! We must not send for a notary, but for a doctor. A doctor? said she, shrugging her shoulders. I am not ill. I am thirsty, that is all. What are you drinking, dear Grandmama? The same as usual, my dear. My glass is there on the table. Give it to me, Valentine. Valentine poured the orangeade into a glass, and gave it to her grandmother with a certain degree of dread, for it was the same glass she fancied that had been touched by the spectre. The marchioness drained the glass at a single draught, and then turned on her pillow, repeating, The notary! The notary! Monsieur de Villefort left the room, and Valentine seated herself at the bedside of her grandmother. The poor child appeared herself to require the doctor she had recommended to her aged relative. A bright spot burned in either cheek, her respiration was short and difficult, and her pulse beat with feverish excitement. She was thinking of the despair of Maximilian, when he should be informed that Madame de saint Marin, instead of being an ally, was unconsciously acting as his enemy. More than once she thought of revealing all to her grandmother, and she would not have hesitated a moment if Maximilian Morel had been named Albert de Morcerf, 
or Raoul de Chateau Renault. But Morel was of plebeian extraction, and Valentine knew how the haughty Marquise de Saint Morin despised all who were not noble. Her secret had each time been repressed when she was about to reveal it, by the sad conviction that it would be useless to do so, for, were it once discovered by her father and mother, all would be lost. Two hours passed thus. Madame de Saint Morin was in a feverish sleep, and the notary had arrived. Though his coming was announced in a very low tone, Madame de Saint Morin arose from her pillow. The notary, she exclaimed, let him come in. The notary, who was at the door, immediately entered. Go, Valentine, said Madame de Samara, and leave me with this gentleman. But, Grandmama, leave me, go, the young girl kissed her grandmother, and left with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the door she found the valet de chambre, who told her that the doctor was waiting in the dining room. Valentine instantly ran down. The doctor was a friend of the family, and at the same time one of the cleverest men of the day, and very fond of Valentine, whose birth he had witnessed. He had himself a daughter about her age, but whose life was one continued source of anxiety and fear to him from her mother having been consumptive. Oh, said Valentine, we have been waiting for you with such impatience, dear Mr. Avrigny. But, first of all, how are Madeleine and Antoinette? Madeleine was the daughter of Monsieur d'Avrigny, and Antoinette his niece. Monsieur d'Avrigny smiled sadly. Antoinette is very well, he said, and Madeleine tolerably so. But you sent for me, my dear child. It is not your father or Madame de Villefort who is ill. As for you, although we doctors cannot divest our patients of nerves, I fancy you have no further need of me than to recommend you not to allow your imagination to take too wide a field. Valentine coloured. Monsieur d'Avrigny carried the science of divination almost to a miraculous extent, for he was one of the physicians who always work upon the body through the mind. No, she replied, it is for my poor grandmother. You know the calamity that has happened to us, do you not? I know nothing, said Monsieur d'Avrigny. Alas, said Valentine, restraining her tears, my grandfather is dead. Monsieur de saint -Marin? Yes. Suddenly? From an apoplectic stroke. An apoplectic stroke? repeated the doctor. Yes, and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband, whom she never left, has called her, and that she must go and join him. Oh, Monsieur d'Avrigny, I beseech you, do something for her. Where is she? In her room with the notary. And Monsieur Noirtier? Just as he was, his mind perfectly clear, but the same incapability of moving or speaking. And the same love for you, eh, my dear child? Yes, said Valentine. He was very fond of me. Who does not love you? Valentine smiled sadly. What are your grandmother's symptoms? An extreme nervous excitement and a strangely agitated sleep. She fancied this morning in her sleep that her soul was hovering above her body, which she at the same time watched. It must have been delirium, she fancies too, that she saw a phantom enter her chamber and even heard the noise it made on touching her glass. It is singular, said the doctor. I was not aware that Madame de saint Morin was subject to such hallucinations. It is the first time I ever saw her in this condition, said Valentine, and this morning she frightened me so that I thought her mad, and my father, who you know is a strong-minded man, himself appeared deeply impressed. We will go and see, said the doctor. What you tell me seems very strange. The notary here descended, and Valentine was informed that her grandmother was alone. Go upstairs, she said to the doctor. And you? Oh, I dare not. She forbade my sending for you, and, as you say, I am myself agitated, feverish and out of sorts. I will go and take a turn in the garden to recover myself. The doctor pressed Valentine's hand, and while he visited her grandmother, 
she descended the steps. We need not say which portion of the garden was her favourite walk. After remaining for a short time in the parterre surrounding the house, and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair, she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench. Then, from the bench, she went to the gate. As usual, Valentine strolled for a short time among her flowers, but without gathering them. The morning in her heart forbade her assuming the simple ornament, though she had not yet had time to put on the outward semblance of woe. She then turned towards the avenue. As she advanced, she fancied she heard a voice speaking her name. She stopped astonished. Then the voice reached her ear more distinctly, and she recognised it to be that of Maximilian. End of chapter 72「私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、It was indeed Maximilian Morel who had passed a wretched existence since the previous day. With the instinct peculiar to lovers he had anticipated after the return of Madame de Saint Marin and the death of the Marquis that something would occur at Monsieur de Villefort's in connection with his attachment for Valentine. His presentiments were realized, as we shall see, and his uneasy forebodings had goaded him pale and trembling to the gate under the chestnut trees. Valentine was ignorant of the cause of this sorrow and anxiety, and as it was not his accustomed hour for visiting her, she had gone to the spot simply by accident or perhaps through sympathy. Morel called her, and she ran to the gate. "'You are here at this hour?' said she. "'Yes, my poor girl,' replied Morel. "'I come to bring and to hear bad tidings.' This is indeed a house of mourning, said Valentine. Speak, Maximilian, although the cup of sorrow seems already full. Dear Valentine, said Morel, endeavoring to conceal his own emotion, listen, I entreat you. What I am about to say is very serious. When are you to be married? I will tell you all, said Valentine. From you I have nothing to conceal. This morning the subject was introduced, and my dear grandmother, on whom I depended as my only support, not only declared herself favorable to it, but is so anxious for it that they only await the arrival of Monsieur de Epinay, and the following day the contract will be signed. A deep sigh escaped the young man, who gazed long and mournfully at her he loved. Alas, replied he, it is dreadful thus to hear my condemnation from your own lips. The sentence is passed, and in a few hours will be executed. It must be so and I will not endeavor to prevent it. But since you say nothing remains but for Monsieur de Epinay to arrive that the contract may be signed, and the following day you will be his, tomorrow you will be engaged to Monsieur de Epinay, for he came this morning to Paris. Valentine uttered a cry. I was at the house of Monte Cristo an hour since, said Morel. We were speaking, he of the sorrow your family had experienced, and I of your grief when a carriage rolled into the courtyard. Never till then had I placed any confidence in presentiments, but now I cannot help believing them, Valentine. At the sound of that carriage I shuddered. Soon I heard steps on the staircase which terrified me as much as the footsteps of the commander did Don Juan. The door at last opened. Albert de Morcerf entered, and I began to hope my fears were vain, when after him another young man advanced, and the Count exclaimed, Ah, here is the Baron Franz de Epinay. I summoned all my strength and courage to my support. Perhaps I turned pale and trembled, but certainly I smiled, and five minutes after I left, without having heard one word that had passed. Poor Maximilian, murmured Valentine. Valentine, the time has arrived that you must answer me. And remember, my life depends on your answer. What do you intend doing? Valentine held down her head. She was overwhelmed. Listen, said Morel. It is not the first time you have contemplated our present position. 
which is a serious and urgent one. I do not think it is a moment to give way to useless sorrow. Leave that for those who like to suffer at their leisure and indulge their grief in secret. There are such in the world, and God will doubtless reward them in heaven for their resignation on earth. But those who mean to contend must not lose one precious moment, but must return immediately the blow which fortune strikes. Do you intend to struggle against our ill fortune? Tell me, Valentine, for it is that I came to know. Valentine trembled and looked at him with amazement. The idea of resisting her father, her grandmother, and all the family had never occurred to her. What do you say, Maximilian? asked Valentine. What do you mean by a struggle? Oh, it would be sacrilege. What? I resist my father's order and my dying grandmother's wish? Impossible. Morel started. You are too noble not to understand me, and yet you understand me so well that you already yield, dear Maximilian. No, no, I shall need all my strength to struggle with myself and support my grief in secret, as you say. But to grieve my father, to disturb my grandmother's last moments, never. You are right, said Morel calmly. In what a tone you speak, cried Valentine. I speak as one who admires you, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle, cried Valentine, mademoiselle, oh, selfish man, he sees me in despair and pretends he cannot understand me. You mistake. I understand you perfectly. You will not oppose Monsieur Villefort. You will not displease the Marchioness, and tomorrow you will sign the contract which will bind you to your husband. But, mon Dieu, tell me, how can I do otherwise? Do not appeal to me, mademoiselle. I shall be a bad judge in such a case. My selfishness will blind me, replied Morel, whose low voice and clenched hands announced his growing desperation. What would you have proposed, Maximilian, had you found me willing to accede? It is not for me to say. You are wrong. You must advise me what to do. Do you seriously ask my advice, Valentine? Certainly, dear Maximilian, for if it is good, I will follow it. You know my devotion to you. Valentine, said Morel, pushing aside a loose plank, give me your hand in token of forgiveness of my anger. My senses are confused, and during the last hour the most extravagant thoughts have passed through my brain. Oh, if you refuse my advice! What do you advise? said Valentine, raising her eyes to heaven and sighing. I am free, replied Maximilian, and rich enough to support you. I swear to make you my lawful wife before my lips even shall have approached your forehead. You make me tremble, said the young girl. Follow me, said Morel. I will take you to my sister, who is worthy also to be yours. We will embark for Algiers, for England, for America, or, if you prefer it, retire to the country, and only return to Paris when our friends have reconciled your family. Valentine shook her head. I feared it, Maximilian, she said. It is the counsel of a madman, and I should be more mad than you did I not stop you at once with the word, impossible, impossible. You will then submit to what fate decrees for you without even attempting to contend with it, said Morel sorrowfully. Yes, if I die. Well, Valentine, resumed Maximilian, I can only say again that you are right. Truly, it is I who am mad and you prove to me that passion blinds the most well-meaning. I appreciate your calm reasoning. It is then understood that tomorrow you will be irrevocably promised to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, not only by that theatrical formality invented to heighten the effect of a comedy called the signature of the contract, but your own will. Again you drive me to despair, Maximilian, said Valentine. Again you plunge the dagger into the wound. What would you do, tell me, if your sister listened to such a proposition? Mademoiselle, replied Morel, with a bitter smile, I am selfish. You have already said so, and as a selfish man I think not of what others would do in my situation, but of what I intend doing myself. I think only that I have known you not a whole year. From the first day I saw you, all my hopes of happiness have been in securing your affection. One day you acknowledged that you loved me, and since that day my hope of future happiness has rested on obtaining you, for to gain you would be life to me. Now I think no more. I say only that fortune has turned against me. I had thought to gain heaven, and now I have lost it. It is an everyday occurrence for a gambler to lose not only what he possesses, but also what he has not. Morel pronounced these words with perfect calmness. Valentine looked at him a moment with her large, scrutinizing eyes, endeavoring not to let Morel discover the grief which struggled in her heart. But in a word, what are you going to do? asked she. 
I am going to have the honor of taking my leave of you, mademoiselle, solemnly assuring you that I wish your life may be so calm, so happy, and so fully occupied that there may be no place for me even in your memory. Oh, murmured Valentine. Adieu, Valentine, adieu, said Morel, bowing. Where are you going? cried the young girl, extending her hand through the opening and seizing Maximilian by his coat, for she understood from her own agitated feelings that her lover's calmness could not be real. Where are you going? I am going that I may not bring fresh trouble into your family, and to set an example which every honest and devoted man situated as I am may follow. Before you leave me, tell me what you are going to do, Maximilian. The young man smiled sorrowfully. Speak, speak, said Valentine. I entreat you. Has your resolution changed, Valentine? It cannot change, unhappy man. You know it must not, cried the young girl. Then adieu, Valentine. Valentine shook the gate with a strength of which she could not have been supposed to be possessed as Morel was going away, and passing both her hands through the opening, she clasped and wrung them. I must know what you mean to do, said she. Where are you going? Oh, fear not, said Maximilian, stopping at a short distance. I do not intend to render another man responsible for the rigorous fate reserved for me. Another might threaten to seek Monsieur Franz, to provoke him and to fight with him. All that would be folly. What has Monsieur Franz to do with it? He saw me this morning for the first time, and has already forgotten he has seen me. He did not even know I existed when it was arranged by your two families that you should be united. I have no enmity against Monsieur Franz, and promise you the punishment shall not fall on him. On whom, then? On me? On you? Valentine! Oh, heaven forbid! Woman is sacred! The woman one loves is holy. On yourself, then, unhappy man, on yourself? I am the only guilty person, am I not? said Maximilian. Maximilian, said Valentine. Maximilian, come back, I entreat you. He drew near with his sweet smile, and but for his paleness one might have thought him in his usual happy mood. Listen, my dear, my adored Valentine, said he in his melodious and grave voice. Those who, like us, have never had a thought for which we need blush before the world, such may read each other's hearts. I never was romantic, and am no melancholy hero. I imitate neither Manfred nor Anthony, but without words, protestations, or vows, my life has entwined itself with yours. You leave me, and you are right in doing so. I repeat it, you are right, but in losing you, I lose my life. The moment you leave me, Valentine, I am alone in the world. My sister is happily married, her husband is only my brother-in-law, that is, a man whom the ties of social life alone attach to me. No one then longer needs my useless life. This is what I shall do. I will wait until the very moment you are married, for I will not lose the shadow of one of those unexpected chances which are sometimes reserved for us, since Monsieur Franz may, after all, die before that time. A thunderbolt may fall even on the altar as you approach it. Nothing appears impossible to one condemned to die, and miracles appear quite reasonable when his escape from death is concerned. I will, then, wait until the last moment, and when my misery is certain, irredeemable, hopeless, I will write a confidential letter to my brother-in-law, another to the prefect of police to acquaint them with my intention, and at the corner of some wood, on the brink of some abyss, on the bank of some river, I will put an end to my existence, as certainly as I am the son of the most honest man who ever lived in France. Valentine trembled convulsively. She loosened her hold of the gate. Her arms fell by her side, and two large tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man stood before her, sorrowful and resolute. Oh, for pity's sake, said she, you will live, will you not? No, on my honor, said Maximilian, but that will not affect you. You have done your duty, and your conscience will be at rest. Valentine fell on her knees and pressed her almost bursting heart. Maximilian, said she, Maximilian, my friend, my brother on earth, my true husband in heaven, I entreat you, do as I do, live in suffering. Perhaps we may one day be united. Adieu, Valentine, repeated Morel. My God, said Valentine, raising both her hands to heaven with a sublime expression, I have done my utmost to remain a submissive daughter. I have begged, entreated, implored. He has regarded neither my prayers, my entreaties, nor my tears. It is done, cried she, willing away her tears and resuming her firmness. I am resolved not to die of remorse, but rather of shame. Live, Maximilian, and I will be yours. 
Say when it shall be. Speak, command, I will obey. Morel, who had already gone some few steps away, again returned, and pale with joy extended both hands towards Valentine through the opening. Valentine, he said, dear Valentine, you must not speak thus. Rather let me die. Why should I obtain you by violence if our love is mutual? Is it from mere humanity you bid me live? I would then rather die. Truly, murmured Valentine, who on this earth cares for me if he does not? Who has consoled me in my sorrow but he? On whom do my hopes rest? On whom does my bleeding heart repose? On him. On him, always on him. Yes, you are right, Maximilian. I will follow you. I will leave the paternal home. I will give up all. Oh, ungrateful girl that I am, cried Valentine, sobbing. I will give up all, even my dear old grandfather, whom I had nearly forgotten. No, said Maximilian, you shall not leave him. Monsieur Nortier has evinced, you say, a kind feeling toward me. Well, before you leave, tell him all. His consent would be your justification in God's sight. As soon as we are married, he shall come and live with us. Instead of one child, he shall have two. You have told me how you talk to him and how he answers you. I shall very soon learn that language by signs, Valentine, and promise you solemnly that instead of despair it is happiness that awaits us. Oh, see, Maximilian, see the power you have over me. You almost make me believe you, and yet what you tell me is madness, for my father will curse me. He is inflexible. He will never pardon me. Now listen to me, Maximilian. If by artifice, by entreaty, by accident, in short, if by any means I can delay this marriage, will you wait? Yes, I promise you, as faithfully as you have promised me that this horrible marriage shall not take place, and that if you are dragged before a magistrate or a priest, you will refuse. I promise you by all that is most sacred to me in the world, namely by my mother. We will wait, then, said Morel. Yes, we will wait, replied Valentine, who revived at these words. There are so many things which may save unhappy beings such as we. I rely on you, Valentine, said Morel. All you do will be well done, only if they disregard your prayers, if your father and Madame de saint Marin insist that Monsieur de Epinay should be called tomorrow to sign the contract. Then you have my promise, Maximilian. Instead of signing, I will go to you and we will fly. But from this moment until then, let us not tempt providence. Let us not see each other. It is a miracle. It is a providence that we have not been discovered. If we were surprised, if it were known that we met thus, we should have no further resource. You are right, Valentine, but how shall I ascertain? From the notary, Monsieur de Champs. I know him, and for myself I will write to you depend on me. I dread this marriage, Maximilian, as much as you. Thank you, my adored Valentine, thank you, that is enough. When once I know the hour, I will hasten to this spot. You can easily get over this fence with my assistance. A carriage will await us at the gate, in which you will accompany me to my sisters. There living, retired, or mingling in society, as you wish, we shall be enabled to use our power to resist oppression and not suffer ourselves to be put to death like sheep, which only defend themselves by sighs. Yes, said Valentine, I will now acknowledge you are a right, Maximilian, and now are you satisfied with your betrothal, said the young girl sorrowfully. My adored Valentine, words cannot express one half of my satisfaction. Valentine had approached, or rather had placed her lips so near the fence that they nearly touched those of Morel, which were pressed against the other side of the cold and inexorable barrier. Adieu, then, till we meet again, said Valentine, tearing herself away. I shall hear from you? Yes. Thanks, thanks, dear love, adieu. The sound of a kiss was heard, and Valentine fled through the avenue. Morel listened to catch the last sound of her dress brushing the branches and of her footsteps on the gravel, then raised his eyes with an ineffable smile of thankfulness to heaven for being permitted to be thus loved, and then also disappeared. The young man returned home, and waited all the evening and all the next day without getting any message. It was only on the following day at about ten o'clock in the morning, as he was starting to call on Monsieur de Champs the notary, that he received from the postman a small billet which he knew to be from Valentine, although he had not before seen her writing. It was to this effect. Tears, entreaties, prayers have availed me nothing. Yesterday for two hours I was at the church of St. Philippe de Roule, and for two hours I prayed most fervently. Heaven is as inflexible as man, and the signature of the contract is fixed for this evening at nine o'clock. 
I have but one promise and but one heart to give. That promise is pledged to you, that heart is also yours. This evening, then, at a quarter to nine at the gate, your betrothed, Valentine de Villefort. P.S. My poor grandmother gets worse and worse. Yesterday her fever amounted to delirium. Today her delirium is almost madness. You will be very kind to me, will you not, Morel, to make me forget my sorrow in leaving her thus? I think it is kept a secret from Grandpapa Nortier that this contract is to be signed this evening. Morel went also to the notary, who confirmed the news that the contract was to be signed that evening. Then he went to call on Monte Cristo and heard still more. Franz had been to announce the ceremony, and Madame de Villefort had also written to beg the Count to excuse her not inviting him. The death of Monsieur de saint Marin and the dangerous illness of his widow would cast a gloom over the meeting which she would regret should be shared by the Count whom she wished every happiness. The day before, Franz had been presented to Madame de saint Marin, who had left her bed to receive him, but had been obliged to return to it immediately after. It is easy to suppose that Morel's agitation would not escape the Count's penetrating eye. Monte Cristo was more affectionate than ever. Indeed, his manner was so kind that several times Morel was on the point of telling him all, but he recalled the promise he had made to Valentine and kept his secret. The young man read Valentine's letter twenty times in the course of the day. It was her first, and on what an occasion. Each time he read it he renewed his vow to make her happy. How great is the power of a woman who has made so courageous a resolution! What devotion does she deserve from him for whom she has sacrificed everything? How ought she really to be supremely loved? She becomes at once a queen and a wife, and it is impossible to thank and love her sufficiently. Morel longed intensely for the moment when he should hear Valentine say, Here I am, Maximilian. Come and help me. He had arranged everything for her escape. Two ladders were hidden in the clover field. A cabriolet was ordered for Maximilian alone without a servant without lights. At the turning of the first street they would light the lamps, as it would be foolish to attract the notice of the police by too many precautions. Occasionally he shuddered. He thought of the moment when, from the top of that wall, he should protect the descent of his dear Valentine, pressing in his arms for the first time her of whom he had yet only kissed the delicate hand. When the afternoon arrived and he felt that the hour was drawing near, he wished for solitude. His agitation was extreme. A simple question from a friend would have irritated him. He shut himself in his room and tried to read, but his eye glanced over the page without understanding a word, and he threw away the book, and for the second time sat down to sketch his plan, the ladders and the fence. At length the hour drew near. Never did a man deeply in love allow the clocks to go on peacefully. Morel tormented his so effectually that they struck eight at half-past six. Then he said, It is time to start. The signature was indeed fixed to take place at nine o'clock, but perhaps Valentine will not wait for that. Consequently, Morel, having left the Rue Millet at half-past eight by his timepiece, entered the clover field while the clock of St. Philippe du Rule was striking eight. The horse and cabriolet were concealed behind a small room where Morel had often waited. The night gradually drew on, and the foliage in the garden assumed a deeper hue. Then Morel came out from his hiding place with a beating heart and looked through the small opening in the gate. There was yet no one to be seen. The clock struck half past eight, and still another half hour was passed in waiting, while Morel walked to and fro and gazed more and more frequently through the opening. The garden became darker still, but in the darkness he looked in vain for the white dress, and in the silence he vainly listened for the sound of footsteps. The house, which was discernible through the trees, remained in darkness and gave no indication that so important an event as the signature of a marriage contract was going on. Morel looked at his watch, which wanted a quarter to ten, but soon the same clock he had already heard strike two or three times rectified the error by striking half-past nine. This was already half an hour past the time Valentine had fixed. It was a terrible moment for the young man. The slightest rustling of the foliage, the least whistling of the wind, attracted his attention, and drew the perspiration to his brow. Then he tremblingly fixed his ladder, and not to lose a moment placed his foot on the first step. Amidst all these alternations of hope and fear the clock struck ten. It is impossible, said Maximilian, that the signing of a contract should occupy so long a time without unexpected interruptions. 
I have weighed all the chances, calculated the time required for all the forms. Something must have happened. And then he walked rapidly to and fro, and pressed his burning forehead against the fence. Had Valentine fainted, or had she been discovered and stopped in her flight? These were the only obstacles which appeared possible to the young man. The idea that her strength had failed her in attempting to escape, and that she had fainted in one of the paths, was the one that most impressed itself upon his mind. In that case, said he, I should lose her, and by my own fault. He dwelt on this idea for a moment, then it appeared reality. He even thought he could perceive something on the ground at a distance. He ventured to call, and it seemed to him that the wind wafted back an almost inarticulate sigh. At last the half-hour struck. It was impossible to wait longer. His temples throbbed violently. His eyes were growing dim. He passed one leg over the wall, and in a moment leaped down on the other side. He was on Villefort's premises, had arrived there by scaling the wall. What might be the consequences? However, he had not ventured thus far to draw back. He followed a short distance close under the wall, then crossed a path he had entered a clump of trees. In a moment he had passed through them, and he could see the house distinctly. Then Morel saw that he had been right in believing that the house was not illuminated. Instead of lights at every window, as is customary on days of ceremony, he saw only a gray mass which was veiled also by a cloud, which at that moment obscured the moon's feeble light. A light moved rapidly from time to time past three windows of the second floor. These three windows were in Madame de saint Marin's room. Another remained motionless behind some red curtains which were in Madame de Villefort's bedroom. Morel guessed all this. So many times, in order to follow Valentine in thought at every hour in the day, had he made her describe the whole house, that without having seen it, he knew it all. This darkness and silence alarmed Morel still more than Valentine's absence had done. Almost mad with grief, and determined to venture everything in order to see Valentine once more, and be certain of the misfortune he feared, Morel gained the edge of the clump of trees, and was going to pass as quickly as possible through the flower garden, when the sound of a voice, still at some distance, but which was borne upon the wind, reached him. At this sound, as he was already partially exposed to view, he stepped back and concealed himself completely, remaining perfectly motionless. He had formed his resolution. If it was Valentine alone, he would speak as she passed. If she was accompanied and he could not speak, still he should see her and know that she was safe. If they were strangers, he would listen to their conversation and might understand something of this hitherto incomprehensible mystery. The moon had just then escaped from behind the cloud which had concealed it, and Morel saw Villefort come out upon the steps, followed by a gentleman in black. They descended in advance towards the clump of trees, and Morel soon recognized the other gentleman as Dr. de Avonray. The young man, seeing them approach, drew back mechanically until he found himself stopped by a sycamore tree in the center of the clump. There he was compelled to remain. Soon the two gentlemen stopped also. Ah, my dear doctor, said the procurer, heaven declares itself against my house. What a dreadful death, what a blow. Seek not to console me. Alas, nothing can alleviate so great a sorrow. The wound is too deep and too fresh. Dead, dead. The cold sweat sprang to the young man's brow, and his teeth chattered. Who could be dead in that house which Villefort himself had called accursed? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor, with a tone which redoubled the terror of the young man, I have not led you here to console you. On the contrary. What can you mean? asked the procurer, alarmed. I mean that behind the misfortune which has just happened to you there is another perhaps still greater. Can it be possible? murmured Villefort, clasping his hands. What are you going to tell me? Are we quite alone, my friend? Yes, quite. But why all these precautions? "'because I have a terrible secret to communicate to you,' said the doctor. "'Let us sit down.'" End of chapter 73, part 1For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 73, Part 2. Villefort fell rather than seated himself. 
The doctor stood before him with one hand placed on his shoulder. Morel, horrified, supported his head with one hand, and with the other pressed his heart, lest its beating should be heard. Dead! Dead! repeated he within himself, and he felt as if he were also dying. Speak, doctor, I am listening, said Villefort. Strike, I am prepared for everything. Madame de saint Marin was doubtless advancing in years, but she enjoyed excellent health. Morel began again to breathe freely, which he had not done during the last ten minutes. "'Grief has consumed her,' said Villefort. "'Yes, grief, doctor. After living forty years with the Marquis—' "'It is not grief, my dear Villefort,' said the doctor. "'Grief may kill, although it rarely does, and never in a day, never in an hour, never in ten minutes.' Villefort answered nothing. He simply raised his head, which had been cast down before, and looked at the doctor with amazement. "'Were you present during the last struggle?' asked Monsieur d'Avenre. "'I was,' replied the procureur. "'You begged me not to leave. Did you notice the symptoms of the disease to which Madame de saint Marin has fallen a victim?' "'I did. Madame de saint Marin had three successive attacks at intervals of some minutes, each one more serious than the former. When you arrived, Madame de saint Marin had already been panting for breath some minutes. She then had a fit, which I took to be simply a nervous attack, and it was only when I saw her raise herself in the bed and her limbs and neck appear stiffened that I became really alarmed. Then I understood from your countenance that there was more to fear than I had thought. This crisis passed, I endeavored to catch your eye, but could not. You held her hand, you were feeling her pulse, and the second fit came on before you had turned towards me. This was more terrible than the first. The same nervous movements were repeated, and the mouth contracted and turned purple. And at the third she expired. At the end of the first attack I discovered symptoms of tetanus. You confirmed my opinion. Yes, before others, replied the doctor. But now we are alone. What are you going to say? Oh, spare me! That the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances are the same. Monsieur de Villefort started from his seat, then in a moment fell down again, silent and motionless. Morel knew not if he were dreaming or awake. Listen, said the doctor, I know the full importance of the statement I have just made, and the disposition of the man to whom I have made it. Do you speak to me as a magistrate, or as a friend? asked Villefort. As a friend, and only as a friend at this moment. The similarity in the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances is so great that were I obliged to affirm by oath what I have now stated, I should hesitate. I therefore repeat to you, I speak not to a magistrate, but to a friend. And to that friend I say, during the three-quarters of an hour that the struggle continued, I watched the convulsions and the death of Madame de saint Marin, and am thoroughly convinced that not only did her death proceed from poison, but I could also specify the poison. Can it be possible? The symptoms are marked, you see. Sleep broken by nervous spasms, excitation of the brain, torpor of the nerve centers, Madame de saint Marin succumbed to a powerful dose of brucine or of strychnine, which by some mistake perhaps has been given to her. Villefort seized the doctor's hand. Oh, it is impossible, said he. I must be dreaming. It is frightful to hear such things from such a man as you. Tell me, I entreat you, my dear doctor, that you may be deceived. Doubtless I may, but— But? But I do not think so. Have pity on me, doctor. So many dreadful things have happened to me lately that I am on the verge of madness. Has any one besides me seen Madame de saint Marin? No. Has anything been sent for from a chemist that I have not examined? Nothing. Had Madame de saint Marin any enemies? Not to my knowledge. Would her death affect any one's interest? It could not, indeed. My daughter is her only heiress, Valentine alone. Oh, if such a thought could present itself, I would stab myself to punish my heart for having one instant harbored it. Indeed, my dear friend, said Monsieur d'Avenre, I would not accuse any one. I speak only of an accident, you understand, of a mistake. But whether accident or mistake, the fact is there. It is on my conscience and compels me to speak aloud to you. Make inquiry. Of whom? How? Of what? May not Barat, the old servant, have made a mistake, and have given Madame de saint Marin a dose prepared for his master? For my father? Yes. But how could a dose prepared for Monsieur Nortier poison Madame de saint Marin? Nothing is more simple. You know poisons become remedies in certain diseases, of which paralysis is one. For instance, having tried every other remedy to restore movement and speech to Monsieur Nortier, I resolved to try one last means, and for three months I have been given him brucine, so that in the last dose I ordered for him there were six grains. 
This quantity, which is perfectly safe to administer to the paralyzed frame of M. Nortier, which has become gradually accustomed to it, would be sufficient to kill another person. My dear doctor, there is no communication between M. Nortier's apartment and that of Madame de saint Marin, and Barat never entered my mother-in-law's room. In short, doctor, although I know you to be the most conscientious man in the world, and although I place the utmost reliance in you, I want, notwithstanding my conviction, to believe this axiom, errare humanum est. Is there one of my brethren in whom you have equal confidence with myself? Why do you ask me that? What do you wish? Send for him. I will tell him what I have seen, and we will consult together and examine the body. And you will find traces of poison? No, I did not say of poison, but we can prove what was the state of the body. We shall discover the cause of her sudden death, and we shall say, Dear Villefort, if this thing has been caused by negligence, watch over your servants. If from hatred, watch your enemies. What do you propose to me, D'Avenre? said Villefort in despair. So soon as another is admitted into our secret, an inquest will become necessary, and an inquest in my house impossible. Still, continued the procurer, looking at the doctor with uneasiness, if you wish it, if you demand it, why, then it shall be done. But, doctor, you see me already so grieved. How can I introduce into my house so much scandal after so much sorrow? My wife and my daughter would die of it. And I, doctor, you know a man does not arrive at the post I occupy. One has not been king's attorney for twenty-five years without having amassed a tolerable number of enemies, mine or numerous. Let this affair be talked of, it will be a triumph for them which will make them rejoice and cover me with shame. Pardon me, doctor, these worldly ideas. Were you a priest, I should not dare tell you that, but you are a man, and you know mankind. Doctor, pray recall your words. You have said nothing, have you? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor, my first duty is to humanity. I would have saved Madame de saint Marin if science could have done it, but she is dead, and my duty regards the living. Let us bury this terrible secret in the deepest recesses of our hearts. I am willing, if any one should suspect this, that my silence on the subject should be imputed to my ignorance. Meanwhile, sir, watch always, watch carefully, for perhaps the evil may not stop here, and when you have found the culprit, if you find him, I will say to you, you are a magistrate, do as you will. I thank you, doctor, said Villefort, with indescribable joy. I never had a better friend than you. And, as if he feared Dr. D'Avenray would recall his promise, he hurried him toward the house. When they were gone, Morel ventured out from under the trees, and the moon shone upon his face, which was so pale it might have been taken for that of a ghost. I am manifestly protected in a most wonderful but most terrible manner, said he. But Valentine, poor girl, how will she bear so much sorrow? As he thought thus, he looked alternately to the window with red curtains and the three windows with white curtains. The light had almost disappeared behind the former. Doubtless Madame de Villefort had just put out her lamp, and the night lamp alone reflected its dull light on the window. At the extremity of the building, on the contrary, he saw one of the three windows open. A wax light placed on the mantelpiece threw some of its pale rays without, and a shadow was seen for one moment on the balcony. Morel shuddered. He thought he heard a sob. It cannot be wondered at that his mind, generally so courageous, but now disturbed by the two strongest human passions, love and fear, was weakened even to the indulgence of superstitious thoughts. Although it was impossible that Valentine should see him hidden as he was, he thought he heard the shadow at the window call him. His disturbed mind told him so. This double error became an irresistible reality, and by one of the incomprehensible transports of youth he bounded from his hiding place and with two strides at the risk of being seen, at the risk of alarming Valentine, at the risk of being discovered by some exclamation which might escape the young girl, he crossed the flower garden, which by the light of the moon resembled a large white lake, and having passed the rows of orange trees which extended in front of the house, he reached the step, ran quickly up, and pushed the door, which opened without offering any resistance. Valentine had not seen him. Her eyes, raised towards heaven, were watching a silvery cloud gliding over the azure, its form that of a shadow mounting towards heaven. Her poetic and excited mind pictured it as the soul of her grandmother. Meanwhile, Morel had traversed the anteroom and found the staircase, which being carpeted prevented his approach from being heard, and he had regained that degree of confidence that the presence of M. de Villefort even would not have alarmed him. He was quite prepared for any such encounter. He would at once approach Valentine's father and acknowledge all, begging Villefort to pardon and sanction the love which united two fond and loving hearts. Morel was mad. 
Happily he did not meet any one. Now especially did he find the description Valentine had given him of the interior of the house useful to him. He arrived safely at the top of the staircase, and while he was feeling his way, a sob indicated the direction he was to take. He turned back. A door partly open enabled him to see his road and to hear the voice of one in sorrow. He pushed the door open and entered. At the other end of the room, under a white sheet which covered it, lay the corpse, still more alarming to Morel since the count he had so unexpectedly overheard. By its side, on her knees, and with her head buried in the cushion of an easy chair, was Valentine, trembling and sobbing, her hands extended above her head, clasped and stiff. She had turned from the window which remained open, and was praying in accents that would have affected the most unfeeling. Her words were rapid, incoherent, unintelligible, for the burning weight of grief almost stopped her utterance. The moon shining through the open blinds made the lamp appear to burn paler and cast a sepulchral hue over the whole scene. Morel could not resist this. He was not exemplary for piety. He was not easily impressed, but Valentine's suffering, weeping, wringing her hands before him was more than he could bear in silence. He sighed and whispered a name, and the head bathed in tears and pressed on the velvet cushion of the chair, a head like that of a Magdalene by Correggio, was raised and turned towards him. Valentine perceived him without betraying the least surprise. A heart overwhelmed with one great grief is insensible to minor emotions. Morel held out his hand to her. Valentine, as her only apology for not having met him, pointed to the corpse under the sheet and began to sob again. Neither dared for some time to speak in that room. They hesitated to break the silence which death seemed to impose. At length Valentine ventured. My friend, said she, how came you here? Alas, I would say you are welcome, had not death opened the way for you into this house. Valentine, said Morel with a trembling voice, I had waited since half-past eight and did not see you come. I became uneasy, leaped the wall, found my way through the garden, when voices conversing about the fatal event. What voices? asked Valentine. Morel shuddered as he thought of the conversation of the doctor and Monsieur de Villefort, and he thought he could see through the sheet the extended hands, the stiff neck, and the purple lips. Your servants, said he, who were repeating the whole sorrowful story, from them I learned it all. But it was risking the failure of our plan to come up here, love. Forgive me, replied Morel, I will go away. No, said Valentine, you might meet someone, stay. But if any one should come here, the young girl shook her head. No one will come, said she. Do not fear. There is our safeguard, pointing to the bed. But what has become of Monsieur d'Epinay? replied Morel. Monsieur Franz arrived to sign the contract just as my dear grandmother was dying. Alas, said Morel, with a feeling of selfish joy, for he thought this death would cause the wedding to be postponed indefinitely. But what redoubles my sorrow, continued the young girl, as if this feeling was to receive its immediate punishment, is that the poor old lady on her deathbed requested that the marriage might take place as soon as possible. She also, thinking to protect me, was acting against me. Hark, said Morel. They both listened. Steps were distinctly heard in the corridor and on the stairs. It is my father who has just left his study. To accompany the doctor to the door, added Morel. How do you know it is the doctor? asked Valentine, astonished. I imagine it must be, said Morel. Valentine looked at the young man. They heard the street door close, then Monsieur de Villefort locked the garden door and returned upstairs. He stopped a moment in the anteroom, as if hesitating whether to turn to his own apartment or into Madame de saint Morin's. Morel concealed himself behind a door. Valentine remained motionless, grief seeming to deprive her of all fear. Monsieur de Villefort passed on to his own room. Now, said Valentine, you can neither go out by the front door nor by the garden. Morel looked at her with astonishment. There is but one way left you that is safe, said she. It is through my grandfather's room. She rose. Come, she added. Where? asked Maximilian. To my grandfather's room. I, in Monsieur Nortier's apartment? Yes. Can you mean it, Valentine? I have long wished it. He is my only remaining friend, and we both need his help. Come. Be careful, Valentine, said Morel, hesitating to comply with the young girl's wishes. I now see my error. I acted like a madman in coming in here. Are you sure you are more reasonable? Yes, said Valentine, and I have but one scruple, that of leaving my dear grandmother's remains which I had undertaken to watch. Valentine, said Morel, death is in itself sacred. Yes, said Valentine, besides it will not be for long. 
She then crossed the corridor and led the way down a narrow staircase to Monsieur Nortier's room. Morel followed her on tiptoe. At the door they found the old servant. Barroy said Valentine, shut the door and let no one come in. She passed first. Nortier seated in his chair and listening to every sound was watching the door. He saw Valentine and his eye brightened. There was something grave and solemn in the approach of the young girl which struck the old man, and immediately his bright eye began to interrogate. "'Dear grandfather,' she said hurriedly, "'you know poor grandmamma died an hour since, and now I have no friend in the world but you.' His expressive eyes evinced the greatest tenderness. "'To you alone, then, may I confide my sorrows and my hopes?' The paralytic motioned yes. Valentine took Maximilian's hand. "'Look attentively, then, at this gentleman.' The old man fixed his scrutinizing gaze with slight astonishment on Morel. "'It is Monsieur Maximilian Morel,' said she, "'the son of that good merchant of Marseilles, whom you doubtless recollect.' "'Yes,' said the old man. "'He brings an irreproachable name, which Maximilian is likely to render glorious, since at thirty years of age he is a captain, an officer of the Legion of Honor.' The old man signified that he recollected him. "'Well, Grandpapa,' said Valentine, kneeling before him and pointing to Maximilian, "'I love him, and will be only his. "'Were I compelled to marry another, I would destroy myself.' The eyes of the paralytic expressed a multitude of tumultuous thoughts. "'You like Monsieur Maximilian Morel, do you not?' Grandpapa asked Valentine. "'Yes. "'And will you protect us, who are your children, against the will of my father?' Nortier cast an intelligent glance at Morel, as if to say— perhaps I may. Maximilian understood him. Mademoiselle, said he, you have a sacred duty to fulfill in your deceased grandmother's room. Will you allow me the honor of a few minutes' conversation with Monsieur Nortier? That is it, said the old man's eye. Then he looked anxiously at Valentine. Do you fear he will not understand? Yes. Oh, we have spoken so often of you that he knows exactly how I talk to you. Then, turning to Maximilian, with an adorable smile, though although shaded by sorrow, he knows everything I know, said she. Valentine arose, placed a chair for Morel, requested Baroy not to admit any one, and having tenderly embraced her grandfather and sorrowfully taken leave of Morel, she went away. To prove to Nortier that he was in Valentine's confidence and knew all their secrets, Morel took the dictionary, a pen, and some paper, and placed them all on a table where there was a light. But first, said Morel, allow me, sir, to tell you who I am, how much I love Mademoiselle Valentine, and what are my designs respecting her. Nortier made a sign that he would listen. It was an imposing sight to witness this old man, apparently a mere useless burden, becoming the sole protector, support, and adviser of the lovers who were both young, beautiful, and strong. His remarkably noble and austere expression struck Morel, who began his story with trembling. He related the manner in which he had become acquainted with Valentine, and how he had loved her, and that Valentine, in her solitude and her misfortune, had accepted the offer of his devotion. He told him his birth, his position, his fortune, and more than once, when he consulted the look of the paralytic, that look answered, That is good. Proceed. And now, said Morel, when he had finished the first part of his recital, now I have told you of my love and my hopes, may I inform you of my intentions? Yes, signified the old man. This was our resolution. A cabriolet was in waiting at the gate, in which I intended to carry off Valentine to my sister's house, to marry her, and to wait respectfully Monsieur de Villefort's pardon. No, said Nortier. We must not do so? No. You do not sanction our project? No. There is another way, said Morel. The old man's interrogative eye said what? I will go, continued Maximilian. I will seek Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. I am happy to be able to mention this in Mademoiselle de Villefort's absence, and will conduct myself toward him so as to compel him to challenge me. Nortier's look continued to interrogate. You wish to know what I will do? Yes. I will find him as I told you. I will tell him the ties which bind me to Mademoiselle Valentine. If he be a sensible man, he will prove it by renouncing of his own accord the hand of his betrothed, and will secure my friendship and love until death. If he refuse, either through interest or ridiculous pride, after I have proved to him that he would be forcing my wife from me, that Valentine loves me and will have no other, I will fight with him, give him every advantage, and I shall kill him, or he will kill me. If I am victorious, he will not marry Valentine, and if I die, I am very sure Valentine will not marry him. 
Nortier watched with indescribable pleasure this noble and sincere countenance on which every sentiment his tongue uttered was depicted, adding by the expression of his fine features all that coloring adds to a sound and faithful drawing. Still, when Morel had finished, he shut his eyes several times, which was his manner of saying no. No, said Morel, you disapprove of the second project as you did the first? I do, signified the old man. But what then must be done? asked Morel. Madame de St. Marin's last request was that the marriage might not be delayed. Must I let things take their course? Nortier did not move. I understand, said Morel. I am to wait. Yes. But delay may ruin our plans, sir, replied the young man. Alone, Valentine has no power. She will be compelled to submit. I am here almost miraculously, and I can scarcely hope for so good an opportunity to occur again. Believe me, there are only the two plans I have proposed to you. Forgive my vanity, and tell me which you prefer. Do you authorize Mademoiselle Valentine to entrust herself to my honor? No. Do you prefer I should seek Monsieur d'Epinay? No. Whence, then, will come the help we need? From chance? resumed Morel. No. From you? Yes. You thoroughly understand me, sir? Pardon my eagerness, for my life depends on your answer. Will our help come from you? Yes. You are sure of it? Yes. There was so much firmness in the look which gave this answer, no one could at any rate doubt his will if they did his power. Oh, thank you a thousand times, but how, unless a miracle should restore your speech, your gesture, your movement, how can you chain to that armchair, dumb and motionless, oppose this marriage? A smile lit up the old man's face, a strange smile of the eyes in a paralyzed face. Then I must wait, asked the young man. Yes. But the contract. The same smile returned. Will you assure me it shall not be signed? Yes, said Nortier. The contract shall not be signed, cried Morel. Oh, pardon me, sir, I can scarcely realize so great a happiness. Will they not sign it? No, said the paralytic. Notwithstanding that assurance, Morel still hesitated. This promise of an impotent old man was so strange that instead of being the result of the power of his will, it might emanate from enfeebled organs. Is it not natural that the madman, ignorant of his folly, should attempt things beyond his power? The weak man talks of burdens he can raise, the timid of giants he can confront, the poor of treasures he spends, the most humble peasant in the height of his pride calls himself Jupiter. Whether Nortier understood the young man's indecision, or whether he had not full confidence in his docility, he looked uneasily at him. "'What do you wish, sir?' asked Morel, that I should renew my promise of remaining tranquil. Nortier's eyes remained fixed and firm, as if to imply that a promise did not suffice. Then it passed from his face to his hands. "'Shall I swear to you, sir?' asked Maximilian. "'Yes,' said the paralytic, with the same solemnity. Morel understood that the old man attached great importance to an oath. He extended his hand. I swear to you on my honor, said he, to await your decision respecting the course I am to pursue with Monsieur d'Epinay. That is right, said the old man. Now, said Morel, do you wish me to retire? Yes. Without seeing Mademoiselle Valentine? Yes. Morel made a sign that he was ready to obey. But, said he, First allow me to embrace you as your daughter did just now. Nortier's expression could not be understood. The young man pressed his lips on the same spot on the old man's forehead where Valentine's had been. Then he bowed a second time and retired. He found outside the door the old servant to whom Valentine had given directions. Morel was conducted along a dark passage, which led to a little door opening on the garden, soon found the spot where he had entered with the assistance of the shrubs, gained the top of the wall, and by his ladder was in an instant in the clover field where his cabriolet was still waiting for him. He got in it, and thoroughly wearied by so many emotions, arrived about midnight in the Rue Malay, threw himself on his bed, and slept soundly. End of chapter 73, part 2「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Clark Bell, Tucson, Arizona, October 
2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 74. The Villefort Family Vault. Chapter 74. The Villefort Family Vault. Two days after, a considerable crowd was assembled towards ten o'clock in the morning around the door of Monsieur de Villefort's house, and a long file of mourning coaches and private carriages extended along the Faubourg Saint-Honoré and the Rue de la Pépinière. Among them was one of a very singular form, which appeared to have come from a distance. It was a kind of covered wagon, painted black, and was one of the first to arrive. Inquiry was made, and it was ascertained that by a strange coincidence, this carriage contained the corpse of the Marquis de saint Morin, and that those who had come thinking to attend one funeral would follow two. Their number was great. The Marquis de saint Morin, one of the most zealous and faithful dignitaries of Louis the Eighteenth and King Charles the Tenth, had preserved a great number of friends and these, added to the personages whom the usages of society gave Villefort a claim on, formed a considerable body. Due information was given to the authorities, and permission obtained that the two funerals should take place at the same time. A second hearse, decked with the same funereal pomp, was brought to Monsieur de Villefort's door, and the coffin removed into it from the post-wagon. The two bodies were to be interred in the cemetery of Père Lachaise, where Monsieur de Villefort had long since had a tomb prepared for the reception of his family. The remains of poor René were already deposited there, and now, after ten years of separation, her father and mother were to be reunited with her. The Parisians, always curious, always affected by funereal display, looked on with religious silence, while the splendid procession accompanied to their last abode two of the number of the old aristocracy, the greatest protectors of commerce and sincere devotees to their principles. In one of the morning coaches, Beauchamp, de Bray, and Chateau Renard were talking of the very sudden death of the Marchioness. I saw Madame de saint Moran only last year in Marseilles, when I was coming back from Algiers, said Chateau Renaud. She looked like a woman destined to live to be a hundred years old, from her apparent sound health and great activity of mind and body. How old was she? Franz assured me, replied Albert, that she was sixty-six years old. But she had not died of old age, but of grief. It appears that since the death of the Marquis, which affected her very deeply, she has not completely recovered her reason. But of what disease, then, did she die? asked de Bray. It is said to have been a congestion of the brain, or apoplexy, which is the same thing, is it not? Nearly. It is difficult to believe that it was apoplexy, said Beauchamp. Madame de saint Morin, whom I once saw, was short, of slender form, and of a much more nervous than sanguine temperament. Grief could hardly produce apoplexy in such a constitution as that of Madame de saint Morin. At any rate, said Albert, whatever disease or doctor may have killed her, Monsieur de Villefort, or rather Mademoiselle Valentin, or still rather our friend Franz, inherits a magnificent fortune, amounting, I believe, to eighty thousand livres per annum and this fortune will be doubled at the death of the old Jacobin Nortier. That is a tenacious old grandfather, said Bouchamp. Tenacem propositi virum. I think he must have made an agreement with death to outlive all his heirs, and he appears likely to succeed. He resembles the old conventionalist of ninety-three, who said to Napoleon in 1814, you bend because your empire is a young stem, weakened by rapid growth. Take the Republic for a tutor. Let us return with renewed strength to the battlefield, and I promise you five hundred thousand soldiers, 
another Marengo, and a second Austerlitz. Ideas do not become extinct, sire. They slumber sometimes, but only revive the stronger before they sleep entirely. Ideas and men appeared the same to him. One thing only puzzles me, namely how Franz Depanay will like a grandfather who cannot be separated from his wife. But where is Franz? In the first carriage with Monsieur de Villefort, who considers him already one of the family. Such was the conversation in almost all the carriages. These two sudden deaths so quickly following each other astonished everyone, but no one suspected the terrible secret which Monsieur d'Avigny had communicated in his nocturnal walk to Monsieur de Villefort. They arrived in about an hour at the cemetery. The weather was mild but dull, and in harmony with the funeral ceremony. Among the groups which flocked towards the family vault, Chateau Renaud recognized Morel, who had come alone in a cabriolet and walked silently along the path bordered with yew trees. "'You here?' said Chateau Renaud, passing his arms through the young captain's. "'Are you a friend of Villefort's? How is it that I have never met you at his house?' I am no acquaintance of Monsieur de Villefort's, answered Morel, but I was of Madame de Saint-Morin. Albert came up to them at this moment with Franz. The time and place are but ill-suited for an introduction, said Albert, but we are not superstitious. Monsieur Morel, allow me to present you Monsieur Franz Depanay, a delightful traveling companion, with whom I made the tour of Italy. My dear Franz, Monsieur Maximilien Morel, an excellent friend I have acquired in your absence, and whose name you will hear me mention every time I make any allusion to affection, wit, or amiability. Morel hesitated for a moment. He feared it would be hypocritical to accost in a friendly manner the man whom he was tacitly opposing, but his oath and the gravity of the circumstances recurred to his memory. He struggled to conceal his emotion, and bowed to Franz. Mademoiselle de Villefort is in deep sorrow, is she not? said de Bray to Franz. Extremely, replied he. She looked so pale this morning I scarcely knew her. These apparently simple words pierced Morel to the heart. This man had seen Valentin, and spoken to her. The young and high-spirited officer required all his strength of mind to resist breaking his oath. He took the arm of Chateau Renaud and turned toward the vault, where the attendants had already placed the two coffins. This is a magnificent habitation, said Bouchamp, looking toward the mausoleum, a summer and winter palace. You will in turn enter it, my dear Depanay, for you will soon be numbered as one of the family. I, as a philosopher, should like a little country house, a cottage down there under the trees, without so many free stones over my poor body. In dying I will say to those around me what Voltaire wrote to Perron, Eorus, and all will be over. But come, Franz, take courage. Your wife is an heiress. Indeed, Beauchamp, you are unbearable. Politics has made you laugh at everything, and political men have made you disbelieve everything. But when you have the honor of associating with ordinary men, and the pleasure of leaving politics for a moment, try to find your affectionate heart, which you leave with your stick when you go to the chamber. But tell me, said Beauchamp, what is life? Is it not a hall in death's anteroom? I am prejudiced against Beauchamp, said Albert, drawing Franz away, and leaving the former to finish his philosophical dissertation with Debray. The Villefort vault formed a square of white stones, about twenty feet high. An interior partition separated the two families, and each apartment had its entrance door. Here were not, as in other tombs, ignoble drawers, one above another, where thrift bestows its dead and labels them like specimens in a museum. All that was visible within the bronze gates was a gloomy-looking room, 
separated by a wall from the vault itself. The two doors before mentioned were in the middle of this wall, and enclosed the Villefort and Saint Moran coffins. There grief might freely expend itself without being disturbed by the trifling loungers who came from a picnic party to visit Père la Chasse, or by lovers who make it their rendezvous. The two coffins were placed on trestles, previously prepared for their reception in the right-hand crypt belonging to the Saint Moran family. Villefort, Franz, and a few near relatives alone entered the sanctuary. As the religious ceremonies had all been performed at the door, and there was no address given, the party all separated. Chateau Renau, Albert, and Morel went one way, and Debray and Bouchamp the other. Franz remained with Monsieur de Villefort. At the gate of the cemetery, Morel made an excuse to wait. He saw Franz and Monsieur de Villefort get into the same morning coach, and thought this meeting foreboded evil. He then returned to Paris, and although in the same carriage with Chateau Renaud and Albert, he did not hear one word of their conversation. As Franz was about to take leave of Monsieur de Villefort, "'When shall I see you again?' said the latter. "'At what time you please, sir,' replied Franz. "'As soon as possible. I am at your command, sir. Shall we return together? If not unpleasant to you?' On the contrary, I shall feel much pleasure. Thus the future father and son-in-law stepped into the same carriage, and Morel, seeing them pass, became uneasy. Villefort and Franz returned to the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. The procureur, without going to see either his wife or daughter, went at once to the study, and offering the young man a chair. Monsieur Depanet, said he, Allow me to remind you at this moment, which is perhaps not so ill-chosen as at first sight may appear, for obedience to the wishes of the departed is the first offering which should be made at their tomb. Allow me then to remind you of the wish expressed by Madame de saint Morin on her deathbed that Valentin's wedding might not be deferred. You know the affairs of the deceased are in perfect order, and her will bequeaths to Valentin the entire property of the Samaram family. The notary showed me the documents yesterday, which will enable us to draw up the contract immediately. You may call on the notary, Monsieur Deschamps, Place Vauveau, Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and you have my authority to inspect those deeds. Sir, replied Monsieur d'Epinay, it is not perhaps the moment for Mademoiselle Valentin, who is in deep distress, to think of a husband. Indeed, I fear Valentin will have no greater pleasure than that of fulfilling her grandmother's last injunctions. There will be no obstacle from that quarter, I assure you. In that case, replied Franz, as I shall raise none, you may make arrangements when you please. I have pledged my word and shall feel pleasure and happiness in adhering to it. Then, said Villefort, nothing further is required. The contract was to have been signed three days since. We shall find it all ready, and can sign it today. But the morning, said Franz, hesitating. Don't be uneasy on that score, replied Villefort. No ceremony will be neglected in my house. Mademoiselle de Villefort may retire during the prescribed three months to her estate of saint Moran, I say hers, for she inherits it today. Then after a few days, if you like, the civil marriage may be celebrated without pomp or ceremony. Madame de saint Moran wished her granddaughter should be married there. When that is over, you, sir, can return to Paris, while your wife passes the time of her mourning with her mother-in-law. "'As you please, sir,' said Franz. "'Then,' replied Monsieur de Villefort, "'have the kindness to wait half an hour. "'Valentin shall come down in the drawing-room. "'I will send for Monsieur de Chance. "'We will read and sign the contract before we separate, "'and this evening Madame de Villefort shall accompany Valentin "'to her estate, where we will rejoin them in a week.' 
Sir, said Franz, I have one request to make. What is it? I wish Albert de Morcerf and Raoul de Chateau Renard to be present at this signature. You know they are my witnesses. Half an hour will suffice to apprise them. Will you go for them yourself, or shall you send? I prefer going, sir. I shall expect you then in half an hour, Baron, and Valentin will be ready. Franz bowed and left the room. Scarcely had the door closed when Monsieur de Villefort sent to tell Valentin to be ready in the drawing-room in half an hour, as he expected the notary and Monsieur Depinay and his witnesses. The news caused a great sensation throughout the house. Madame de Villefort would not believe it, and Valentin was thunderstruck. She looked around for help, and would have gone down to her grandfather's room, but on the stairs she met Monsieur de Villefort, who took her arm and led her into the drawing-room. In the ante-room Valentin met Barrois, and looked despairingly at the old servant. A moment later Madame de Villefort entered the drawing-room with her little Edouard. It was evident she had shared the grief of the family, for she was pale and looked fatigued. She sat down, took Edouard on her knees, and from time to time pressed this child on whom her affections appeared centered, almost convulsively to her bosom. Two carriages were soon heard to enter the courtyard. One was the notary's, the other that of Franz and his friends. In a moment the whole party was assembled. Valentin was so pale one might trace the blue veins from her temples round her eyes and down her cheeks. Franz was deeply affected. Chateau Renaud and Albert looked at each other with amazement. The ceremony which was just concluded had not appeared more sorrowful than did that which was about to begin. Madame de Villefort had placed herself in the shadow behind a velvet curtain, and as she constantly bent over her child, it was difficult to read the expression of her face. Monsieur de Villefort was, as usual, unmoved. The notary, after having, according to the customary method, arranged the papers on the table, taken his place in an armchair, and raised his spectacles, turned toward France. "'Are you Monsieur Franz de Quenel, Baron d'Epinay?' asked he, although he knew it perfectly. "'Yes, sir,' replied Franz. The notary bowed. I have then to inform you, sir, at the request of Monsieur de Villefort, that your projected marriage with Mademoiselle de Villefort has changed the feeling of Monsieur Nortier toward his grandchild, and that he disinherits her entirely of the fortune he would have left her. Let me hasten to add, continued he, that the testator, having only the right to alienate a part of his fortune, and having alienated it all, the will will not bear scrutiny, and is declared null and void. Yes, said Villefort, but I warn Monsieur d'Epinay that during my lifetime my father's will shall never be questioned, my position forbidding any doubt to be entertained. Sir, said Franz, I regret much that such a question has been raised in the presence of Mademoiselle Valentin. I have never inquired the amount of her fortune which, however limited it may be, exceeds mine. My family has sought consideration in this alliance with Monsieur de Villefort. All I seek is happiness. Valentin imperceptibly thanked him, while two silent tears rolled down her cheeks. Besides, sir, said Villefort, addressing himself to his future son-in-law, accepting the loss of a portion of your hopes, this unexpected will need not personally wound you. Monsieur Nortier's weakness of mind sufficiently explains it. It is not because Mademoiselle Valentin is going to marry you that he is angry, but because she will marry. A union with any other would have caused him the same sorrow. Old age is selfish, sir, and Mademoiselle de Villefort has been a faithful companion to Monsieur Nortier, which she cannot be when she becomes the Baroness d'Epinay. My father's melancholy state prevents our speaking to him on any subjects, which the weakness of his mind would incapacitate him from understanding, and I am perfectly convinced 
that at the present time, although he knows that his granddaughter is going to be married, Monsieur Nortier has even forgotten the name of his intended grandson. Monsieur de Villefort had scarcely said this when the door opened and Barrois appeared. Gentlemen, said he, in a tone strangely firm for a servant speaking to his masters under such solemn circumstances, Gentlemen, Monsieur Nortier de Villefort wishes to speak immediately to Monsieur Franz de Quesnel, Baron d'Epinay. He, as well as the notary, that there might be no mistake in the person, gave all the titles to the bridegroom-elect. Villefort started. Madame de Villefort let her son slip from her knees. Valentin rose pale and dumb as a statue. Albert and Chateau Renard exchanged a second look, more full of amazement than the first. The notary looked at Villefort. It is impossible, said the procureur. Monsieur Depinay cannot leave the drawing room at present. It is at this moment, replied Berois with the same firmness, that Monsieur Nortier, my master, wishes to speak on important subjects to Monsieur Franz Depinay. Grandpapa Nortier can speak now, then, said Edouard with his habitual quickness. However, his remark did not make Madame de Villefort even smile. So much was every mind engaged, and so solemn was the situation. Astonishment was at its height. Something like a smile was perceptible on Madame de Villefort's countenance. Valentin instinctively raised her eyes, as if to thank heaven. "'Pray go, Valentin,' said Monsieur de Villefort, "'and see what this new fancy of your grandfather's is.' Valentin rose quickly, and was hastening joyfully toward the door, when Monsieur de Villefort altered his intention. "'Stop,' said he, "'I will go with you.' "'Excuse me, sir,' said Franz. "'Since Monsieur Nortier sent for me, I am ready to attend to his wish. "'Besides, I shall be happy to pay my respects to him, "'not having yet had the honor of doing so.' "'Pray, sir,' said Villefort, with marked uneasiness, "'do not disturb yourself.' "'Forgive me, sir,' said Franz, in a resolute tone. "'I would not lose this opportunity of proving to to Monsieur Nortier, how wrong it would be of him to encourage feelings of dislike to me, which I am determined to conquer, whatever they may be, by my devotion. And without listening to Villefort, he arose and followed Valentin, who was running downstairs with the joy of a shipwrecked mariner who finds a rock to cling to. Monsieur de Villefort followed them. Chateau Renard and Morcerf exchanged a third look of still increasing wonder. End of chapter 74